Mark Ferrari, welcome to Tech Talk with Daniel. Hi, pleasure to be here. I'll start off by saying that it's an honor to have you here for a conversation. We corresponded over the years on Twitter, but there's nothing quite like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a person who, among others, has worked on my favorite adventure game of all time, Loom. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Let's start at the beginning. How did you get into art? Okay, well, hmm. <laughs> People usually ask me how I got into computer games, but I was into art well before computers or computer games were anywhere on the horizon. Um, I grew up as one of those artistic kids who drew pictures all through math class, things like that, um, and decided in my late 20s to become an illustrator um, and was just really a couple months into that career. Things were going fairly well and uh, I, I used a very unusual medium. My medium was colored pencil, uh, barrel Prismacolor pencils, which uh, if you've seen the work on my website, don't look like colored pencil drawings. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that one of the reasons my work actually attracted as much attention as it did at the time was that it was done in colored pencil and people were amazed that you could do that in colored pencil back in 1986 or seven. Um, I think if I had done the very same images in paint, people would have said, wow, that's really good and forgotten them almost immediately. So weirdly, I think that my medium may have had something to do with my visibility. Um, I think that, I mean, I just feel like I should just go straight to how did I end up at Lucasfilm? Because for me, that was a real departure. No, you can, take, you can talk about the entire process if you'd like. Okay. So I was interested in doing fantasy science fiction type illustration, but, uh, and I got a job almost out the gate with a company called, a gaming company named Chaosium, who was doing um, a series of, uh, Cthulian uh, role-playing games, and they were uh, they were doing one about the Dream Worlds based on H.P. Lovecraft's uh, Dream World content in his stories. And I ended up my first job was with the colored pencils was uh, doing a book with thirty full-page, full-color illustrations of various creatures, kind of a bestiary from the Dreamlands, which could not have been more perfect for me. But I wanted to show this work and get around, and I had no idea how. So even though I'd been an avid reader uh, of science fiction fantasy, uh, particularly fantasy, since literally the fourth grade, when our teacher read us The Hobbit a little bit at a time all year in class, um, I had never heard of or much less been to a science fiction fantasy convention. And somebody at one of my favorite bookstores said, you should put these up at a a science fiction fantasy convention art show. And I said, what is that? So they told me about a convention in San Jose, California, not far from the Bay Area where I lived then. And I signed up for it and got space. And I still had no idea what I was getting involved in. I thought this was going to be like a shopping mall craft fair or something where I was going to have a booth and, you know, people would stop by to look at my pictures in between shopping for clothes and you know, getting a burger. And I got there and discovered a big hotel full of celebrated professionals from literally all over the country um, and a giant art show with many of the most renowned illustrators in the late 80s uh, or early 80s at that time. And I just felt immediately out of my depth. I thought, oh, I had no idea this was serious. So I put my stuff up in a back corner but the fact that it was colored pencil really amazed people. A woman came up while I was still hanging the pieces and said, are those prints or is that, are those originals? I said, those are all originals. And she said, what are they done in? Because it wasn't a painting, clearly. They were too small and too detailed and there was no, none of that painterly texture. But so I said, colored pencil and her eyes got big and she said, you're kidding me. And then she said, wait here. And ran off. And I figured she was going to report me to the uh, to the art show staff and tell them there was somebody 
posting pictures in a kid's medium in the back corner and they should kick me out. But what she actually did was she brought a fellow with her and said, this, this is what I'm talking about. That's colored pencil. And he said, really? And then he introduced himself. His name was Tom Kidd and he was the artist guest of honor that year at the convention. And he was full of questions and curiosity for my colored pencil drawings. And he kind of took me under his wing that week and introduced me to a lot of really gifted illustrators. Um, toward the end of the week, being the artist guest of honor, he also uh, was approached by Gary Winnick, who was at the convention as well. And he was the art director at Lucasfilm Games at that time. And Gary wanted to know whether Tom might be interested in considering doing computer art for their computer games. And Tom said, you know, told him, I live in Connecticut and I have a pretty full schedule these days. I don't really think this is something I could fit in, but there is a relatively new artist here I think you should meet. And he introduced me to Gary Winnick. And Gary looked at my work and loved it and said, you know, I would also be interested in talking with you about working for Lucasfilm Games. And I told him, of course, I would love to work for Lucasfilm out on Skywalker Ranch in Marin. But I also told him in 1987 that I was a dyed in the wool technophobe who had never owned or touched a computer and had knew nothing about them. And I, I wasn't sure I was really the right guy for the job. And his response immediately was, we have much better luck finding artists and teaching them to use a computer than finding computer technicians and teaching them to be artists. So if you're willing to give it a try, we'll just schedule to come out and do a screen test, see how you take to the tool. And if that works out, I would love to get you into computer art. So I went out to... I called my parents that night, who also lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, which is where all this was happening, and told them what had just happened, and found out that my father, who was an educator, had just bought an Atari computer and actually had a computer pixel paint program on his computer, um, which he had never used, just came with the computer. This was back in the days when com when household computers were just just starting to show up commonly. Most of us didn't have them at the time. And I was astonished that my father had one. So I drove over to their house and spent a few hours figuring out how to draw in pixels on this computer program, which wasn't D-Paint, but which is a deluxe paint too by Electronic Arts, uh, but was something very close to it. So I wasn't a complete virgin when I went out to Skywalker Ranch a week later and sat down to do the screen test and uh, they asked for a background and I created one in an hour or two and they seemed really surprised that I was even this good at it if I'd never done any of this before. So I was hired to do backgrounds for Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. That was my first game to work on doing background. I was a background artist. I did not do animation or character art or any of those things, just environments. And there's a whole lot more story from there, but perhaps I should let you ask you know for the time questions. That, did you know at the time that Lucasfilm had a computer games division or it came as a surprise? I to you? had no idea. I mean, you know, I had seen Star Wars like everybody else in the world had seen Star Wars. I had no idea that there were computer games. But then again, you have to remember, and a few weeks earlier, I'd had no idea that there were science fiction fantasy conventions, much less what this one would be. So uh, this was all coming out of the blue uh, at me. And and when you came for an interview, they asked you to do, uh, like you said, a background picture. Do you remember what you drew? Oh, yeah. No, they asked me to do a background picture, probably a sample for Zach McCracken that was coming up. Um, and I believe it was an African plain type scene with some grass huts and some skulls on poles and some animals in the background. Um, you know, they gave me a little brush. That's what they called uh, character animation sprites in those days mm -hmm. was brushes. They gave me a little brush of Zach. I didn't know it was Zach at the time, but a, a brush of a, a guy standing there that I could use for scale. Um, but I had no idea 
you know, they didn't attach, they didn't give me any information about what games they were working on or anything else. They just said, here's a little guy, put him in an African plane or with some grass huts in the foreground and, you know, things like that and animals in the background. And so I drew it. I did a lot of things that I would soon find out were not actually allowed for game art with this D-Paint program, but they didn't bother discussing any of that with me either. They just wanted to see, you know, I was somebody who had come from a traditional illustration background using traditional media to do finely detailed art in an almost unlimited palette of colors. And they just wanted to see if I could make the adjustment to using these 16 pretty awful colors and these little square bricks of those solid awful colors to create a picture in. And I guess I did better than they were expecting me to do, though I didn't tell them I'd spent hours fooling around on my dad's paint program before I came. So, well, sixteen colors at the time was a lot. I played Zach McCracken on my they had, monochrome screen. Mm-hmm. They had just moved from I think it was four colors in CGA to EGA, yep. and this was a big advance for them. But for me, it was just a massive step backward. And it was, I mean, really using that palette and this medium was a gigantic frustration for me. There were a hundred things I had been trained to do and loved to do as a traditional illustrator that were simply not transferable to this medium. Um, it turns out the tool was pretty simple. Learning the tool was nothing for me, but learning how to create images you'd want to look at was much harder um, and it got even harder a few days after they hired me. So uh, the first thing I started doing was trying to figure out how to push this artwork into some better looking mode. And I very quickly discovered two things, which was that there was a checkerboard fill function there so that I could fill an area or draw with uh, pixels of two different colors, every other pixel changing to between back and forth between two different pixels. And CRT monitors back then were sufficiently blurry that when you did that, it almost blended into a third mixed color on screen. You could see the pixels, but not very clearly. So it really read as a third color. And I quickly discovered that if you took these 16 really awful colors, and if you want me to, I can tell you more about why they were really awful. But um, these really I awful colors. Why you think, first of all, I know why they're awful, because they're right. awful, right. objectively yes. awful. Right. But why do you think they're awful? Well, there are, when it comes to the use of color, there are a couple of things that are just staples for, you know, somebody who's trying to make uh, an enjoyable and realistic figurative image. One is you need unsaturated colors and saturated colors. And if you don't know what I mean by that, unsaturated colors are like dull not very vibrant colors, grays and browns and, you know, uh, uh, colors with a lot of gray in them. Saturated colors are very vibrant, glowy colors, you know, hot pink and, you know, fluorescent chartreuse. Those are extremely saturated colors. You need both to make a good looking picture and a believable image. Um, and also you need earth tones and you need flesh tones, whatever that means, depending on, you know, what ethnicity of a person you're trying to draw. But you need earth tones and flesh tones. You know, that you need you need to be able to every kind of subject matter has its own sort of palette family. And this 16 colors had none of that. All of the colors, except for gray, white and black, were very saturated. Almost none of them were natural colors. I mean, there wasn't any color to make stone out of. There was no real flesh tone. There was this, I mean, all of the, all of the colors, again, other than gray, white, and black were highly saturated. They were almost fluorescent. There was a chemically hot pink and a chemically fluorescent chartreuse and an electric blue and a just highly saturated crimson red and this day glow sort of orange pink 
I mean, which one of those were you supposed to make skin out of? Which one of those were you supposed to make stones or tree trunks or wood? Atmosphere. Well, again, it's, it's better than CGA. Well, yes. In CGA, you had to both, make. Both the size of the pixels and the palette were certainly better than CGA. If they'd hired me to do CGA work, I would have just said, I'm sorry, there is nothing. I cannot make art out of this. I mean, except in an abstract sense. Uh, I mean, they purple, did, obviously. Purple flesh tones uh, is something very natural. Well, yes. If, if you're making Maniac Mansion, purple flesh tones make sense, but uh, which I believe they had completed just shortly before I got involved. So, uh, so yeah, they were they were horrible colors, and I suspect that these colors were invented by people who did understand computers and understood slide bars for RGB controls, and pretty much moved those slide bars at sort of equal intervals until they had two represented a light and a dark representative of each of the basic color wheel color families and said there now we have everything and they certainly did compared to cga but i i would have begged for a few different choices i think um if if anybody had consulted me ahead of time of course nobody did because i was a non-entity in the computer world um But so they were they were horrible colors, but I discovered that by dithering them in a checkerboard, I could blend them to get intermediate colors, many of which were much more useful. So my first few days and, and I don't even know if it was a few days, a day, my first day or two on the job, starting backgrounds for Maniac Mansion, I began dithering these colors to create a more realistic, you know, painterly kind of look and to create earth tones and unsaturated colors and intermediary colors that were nowhere in the palette. And I'd hardly been doing it when Ron Gilbert, who was the, you know, the, the sort of tech head of the development uh, of the team at that time, and some of his um, programmers sort of came running in in a dither, so to speak, uh, very upset and told me, no, 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 you cannot dither these colors. And then they explained to me that uh, the way the engine worked, it scanned the colors in horizontal scan lines across the image. And every time there was a color change, it recorded that color change with a bit of data. And I don't remember whether the disks that these games went out on then, the floppy disks, these, I mean, I think it was five inch floppy disks still at that point. I don't remember whether they were 50 megabyte disks or a hundred and I think I think they were 50 megabyte disks, maybe. 50 kilobytes, were, maybe. Yeah, they were very, maybe it was 150 kilobytes. I don't know, but um, they were tiny. And mm. when I dithered an area in a drawing, there was another bit of data added for every one of those pixels. And I could eat up an entire disk worth of space with just one dithered picture. So they said, nope, can't do that. You have to use solid colors or horizontal stripes. You, if you want to blend colors, You can do it with horizontal stripes, but that's it. So I did the rest of Zach McCracken in solid EGA colors with sometimes horizontal stripe shading by making the stripes further and further apart. Did the best I could, but it was it was agony for me as a traditional illustrator um, to uh, To, to be unable to take these images further. Um, and towards the end of that project, we all got into crunch mode and they allowed us to take our computers home for the weekend one day. They didn't want us coming in to Skywalker Ranch on the weekend, but they let us take our computers home to sort of finish a lot of things up there. And I went home and I finished up my work. And when I was done, the computer was sitting there on the dining room table and I had time So I sat down and I did a fully dithered scene just for my own enjoyment. It was a, it was a, a, it was hills receding into the distance covered in live oak trees at twilight with sort of a band of sunset in the distance and a crescent moon and the evening star and, you know, the, the sort of those evening lighting conditions. And it was really pretty beautiful. And when I got back to work at Skywalker Ranch on Monday, you know, I did my work until it was time to go to lunch. Lunch was often a somewhat lengthy affair there because lunch was really pleasant. You went and had lunch at a beautiful buffet in a gorgeous dining room in the Victorian mansion that was George Lucas's administrative building. And 
there were often celebrities sitting off in the corners of that room and nobody nobody raced to lunch and raced back to work so i was gone for a while and when i came back steve arnold who was the head of the whole computer games division at that time i believe uh, and ron gilbert were having a very I'll call it a very animated conversation in front of my monitor because when I went to lunch, I had simply put that screen up on that picture that I'd done at home up on my monitor and left the office for lunch. Just let the picture sit there as kind of a silent protest. This is what our games could look like if we could dither. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just left the picture there. And when I got back, Steve Arnold and Ron, we're having this animated conversation about why we couldn't uh, compress dither uh, some way that didn't cause dither to fill up disks. And sure enough, within a month or two, I think, we, we could compress dither. Dither no longer ate up disks. So the next game we did was Loom, and that was Lucasfilm's first dithered EGA game. And as I, you're probably aware it won all kinds of graphics awards because it looked like a VGA game before anybody was making VGA games. Um, now, before we get into Loom, um, I want to go back to Zach McCracken. When you worked on Zach McCracken, did, at that point, did you see Maniac Mansion? Did you play it? Did you use it as inspiration or you just went your own way? No, I saw bits of art in passing from Maniac Mansion. Gary would sometimes, I shared an office with Gary that first year. In fact, I may mm -hmm. have shared an office with Gary pretty much the whole time I was there. Um, and uh, I'm sure Gary pulled up some screens just to explain how game environments needed to be laid out and the dynamics of a game and things like this. And, and I thought it was interesting. And yes, I remember feeling really grateful that I hadn't had to do CGA art. Um, but the, something I should have said a while ago, and I guess I'd better say now, is that my real interest professionally and in many ways in life at that point was art. I had never played a computer game. I had never used a computer. I didn't know much about them, and I really wasn't very interested in them. I've, I've never been a technology kind of guy. I was no good at auto mechanics. You know, I, they're just, I didn't, I had no relationship at all with power tools. I mean, in some ways, I was a terrible failure as a guy. But um, I, I had no real interest in computer games. So no, I wasn't playing them. <clears throat> I had an interest in science fiction fantasy literature. I had an interest in storytelling. And these games were storytelling games. So I was very interested in the storytelling aspect of these games. But that wasn't a technical issue for me. That was, you know, a narrative artistic issue for me. Um, so I was really there about art. I was about art when, Will, when Gary found me at that convention art show and I continued being about art and I focused on the art and art that I liked really interested me and I really paid attention and art that I didn't like, I looked at and I thought about for a minute and I moved on. So this is why, although I was aware of Sierra Online, I didn't spend a lot of time because the art that they were doing was just not the kind of art I wanted to do. And I didn't look at earlier Lucasfilm games because there wasn't a whole lot there to hold my interest artistically. I think those games had a great deal narratively and in terms of gameplay and things that was not only that would have not only been interesting to me, but was more interesting than I had any capacity to understand uh, at that time. Um, but mostly I was there about the art. So I, I dealt with the technical stuff whenever I needed to for artistic reasons. And I was passionate and obsessed with creating art for these games as art. Uh, I had no problem working for hours and hours and hours, days and days and days on end on the art. But when the game was all done, I never took one home and played it. Um, the part that interested me was already done. And I just never played many of those games until much later. I did end up playing some of them much later, but that's that's part of that's a different part of the story I'm sure we'll get to before we're done here. I don't think I better go there now. So now after Zach McCracken you worked on Pipe Dream. Now I really liked Pipe Dream back in the day, and I've even created similar games myself. 
Hey, what was your role in that project? I think... I, I mean, I do remember Pipe Dream, and in fact, <laughs> that's a game I played. <laughs> I found that game addictive. It was, it was a level of complexity that I could handle. Um, <laughs> the, the point and click adventure games were just too complicated and too much pointing and too much clicking and too much yeah. understanding computer game format. But Pipe Dream, That was quite simple and quite addictive. So while I worked on it, I ended up actually sort of spending a lot of time playing it as well. And thank you for reminding me when it fit, because I remember working on the game, but for years I haven't been able to remember what that came before, or what that came after. So it's interesting to well, know that that was, was between Zach, Zach Pipe Dream. And okay. Lou. I had forgotten that order. So that's interesting. I, I am pretty sure that I did all the art for Pipe Dream. I don't think there was any screen graphics in there that I didn't do. Um, I mean, it was a just, a, it was the mazes and the pipes and the liquid and the stuff. There wasn't, there were no cut scenes or characters in there, were there? there? There was the splash screen, which was a rendition of the cover art. Right, okay. So I don't know if I did the splash screen or not, but I certainly did all of the in-game art and it wasn't that hard to do. I mean, there was the graphic for the piping and there was the graphic for the maze. And once you had a few pieces, it was pretty easy to just vary those pieces to the rest of what was needed. So it was, I think it was something to keep me busy. I think they gave it to me to keep me busy between Zach McCracken and the next game. So, but I loved it. I loved the game. And it was one that I actually played for years after that. Now it's time for me to ask you about Loom. Okay, let's go there. <laughs> But before we talk about the game itself, I want us to talk about the cover art. Not many people know that it was actually done using colored pencil, right? That's right. Yes, they had me do the cover and I did it in my then standard medium of barrel Prismacolor and the hand that is holding the cat's cradle in that image is my mother's hand. So that was my mom's hand on that cover. Sorry, not Bobbins. We, we talked about it on Twitter and I was amazed back then to hear the inspiration behind it. Now, did she actually pose with the hands or how, what was the inspiration behind the cover art? Well, the inspiration behind the cover art, I mean, They did not want, you know, obviously they wanted realistic cover art. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, if this had happened later in my career, I would probably have chosen other images. But at the time I was into looking for the simplest possible ways to convey meaning. And Loom was about a guy, a mysterious guy without a face, mm -hmm. uh, who had magic ability with weaving with threads with you know weaving on a loom and i didn't want to draw a picture of a loom um and for me i think i think part of the problem too was i mean part of the reason the cover image i shouldn't call it the problem but part of the reason that that cover image ended up being what it was is because they had they asked the environmental artist to draw the cover if they'd asked one of the character animator artists on the team to draw the cover it would have been full of characters but i didn't really draw characters at that point i drew environments so for me loom was as much about the world of loom I mean, I guess that mm -hmm. was foremost in my mind, this sort of shadowy, eternal twilight kind of world of loom and the magic geese flying through the sky. And, you know, it was, I was more focused on the place than on the people. So I wanted to draw the place, you know, the magic twilight realm uh, of that island. I wanted to draw that place, but it couldn't just be a picture of an island. So... I decided that the thing to do was to draw only the part of the person that had to do with magic and weaving and 
threads and, you know, that whole textile kind of magic thing. And I thought, cat's cradle, cat's cradle, but cat's cradle emitting light. So I just decided to draw Bobbin's hands weaving strings in front of the twilight world of, of the island in Loom. And, and it's interesting uh, because this particular part isn't part of the game. It's not an no. not something in the game that's inspired. No, that there is no cat. The there's no cat's cradle in the game. There's no weaving string in your fingers. But to me, that just conveyed weaving and magic and the place in which the story took takes place. And I think that if they had asked Steve Purcell, as they usually did, to do the covers, he would have done one of his spectacular covers, full of characters and whimsical things. At the same time, Loom was a very sober, very artistic game, as opposed to a lot of the others that were zany and comical and, you know, kind of outrageous. And that's probably why they didn't give it to Steve is because he was a guy who did zany, outrageous, fabulous comics art. In fact, I have uh, one of his Sam and Max covers hanging above my desk right now. Have really? had for many years. Yes, I am a Cool. Gigantic fan of Steve Purcell's art and have been since day one. Well, it's funny that you should mention what would happen if a character artist would draw the cover of Loom, because when the game came out in Japan, they didn't use your cover. They actually drew a different cover. Did you see that cover? I think I did. I don't really remember it very clearly, but I did. In fact, was this, this is the, the cover? Ichi this is the Let cover. Let me see. Ah, there you go. Yeah, there's the loom and the characters. But so, see, to me, <clears throat> those, to me, those heads against a loom, uh, the guy in the foreground is great, but those heads against a loom, it, it kind of looks like a collage. It, it looks like product art. You know what I mean? I agree. Your so, cover is better. That's well. I don't know that my cover's better. My cover is different. I guess what I'm saying is that that's exactly better. why I didn't try to sort of stick all of the relevant objects in the cover. Now, Steve Purcell would have stuck all the relevant objects in the cover and he would have done it brilliantly. Um, I'm just going to say. But uh, thank you for showing that to me, by the way. Um, another thing to know, speaking of. And so was that the was that the Japanese release of the EGA game or was that the VGA game? So in Japan, it was released on a console, which was called FM Towns, and it was the VGA version because the FM Towns was a much stronger computer. So Right. So the VGA game, none of that is actually my artwork. That is my mm -hmm. artwork interpreted by other artists. And I don't envy them the job they were given. Um, that's. I think that's very difficult. I can't actually... I cannot imitate other people's artwork very well at all. I can draw what I can draw the way I draw it. And I'm early in my career. A lot of people used to look at my portfolio and go, this is great. I think I have work for you. And then they would say, wait a minute. And they go into the next office and they <clears throat> bring out some painting by some famous illustrator and say, can you do this? You know, they were hoping that I was talented enough to knock off some more famous illustrators work. And I kept saying, no, I can do what was in my portfolio. So a lot of them were very disappointed to hear that. But, uh, but they, they translated my artwork. And I think that in a lot of ways, and we'll, we'll talk in some depth about this later, I think, although I found the incredibly simplistic and limited EGA environment very frustrating at first, not much further down the line, the challenge of figuring out how to move that limited and restricting environment further and achieve art with it was such an intriguing challenge that I ended up doing some of my most creative work because of how limited and restricting that environment was. And when we got into VGA, it was just too easy to kind of fake things and take the easy route because you had you know, virtually, if not literally, all the colors. Yeah, you had gradients. So there was a great reliance on gradients there. And I think that it kind of diminished some aspects of the original EGA art because gradients were used instead of 
instead of the starker choices that we had used of necessity in the EGA version. So, um, yeah, the, the EGA version was me and everything after that was people interpreting my work. And again, no one I appreciate talk about the difficulty that. of their job. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if it was an easy thing to do. While we're talking about the cover art, I want to show you the cover art of the version I played as a kid. I have the Hebrew version of Loom. Ah. We have a different cover to get. Let me just remove my background. So this was the cover of Loom I had. Well, that looks like my work. It is your work, but as you can see, they, they blocked the English text for Loom and right. uh, basically changed the marble design because the marble design on um, the marble design on the original cover was blue, and this one is uh -huh. grayish. Right. Well, grayish gives you more contrast with the picture, certainly. Um, I don't think the back, the back cover is also different. It has different screenshots. Right. Yeah. So I had nothing to do with anything except for the image of the hands in the, you know, over the island and the, and the cat's cradle. Uh, the rest mm -hmm. of that would have been done by graphic designers, packaging people for Lucasfilm. So um, none, nothing except the image on any of those boxes uh, were, were me. Now, after we talked about the cover art, let's talk about the actual game. That was when the part you I first, was interested in. <laughs> when did you first hear about the project and how did Brian Moriarty present it to you? So it wasn't presented to me. It was presented to us. So this is a good time to talk about another, uh, another I think, important aspect of the gaming industry in the late 80s and early 90s as opposed to the gaming industry today uh, or much later than that. I was hired by Lucasfilm in 1987. In 1987, computer games, graphic computer games, there had been text adventures for quite a while by then, um, but graphic computer games were a pretty much brand new thing. We were, we were operating in a new frontier. And these days, games are produced by huge companies and you may have a team of anywhere from 30 or 40 to a hundred or more people working on a game and they all work as separate teams. There are designers and there are programmers and there are animators and there are environmental artists and they're all off in their own enclaves. They get together occasionally for meetings when there's something that involves input from two different entities, but mostly they're working separately. And back in the late eighties at a place like Lucasfilm, a team that created a game like Zack McCracken or Loom or Secret of Monkey Island was maybe a dozen people. Uh, that, you know, a couple of three or four programmers, three or four artists, a designer, a music guy, the art director. Um, you know, that was about it. So it was an incredibly collegial process. There were so few of us that there was no need. I mean, it would have been a little silly to have, you know, two people having meetings about what to do about things. So we just got together as a team. If there were questions about the story or about the animation or about the game design, or we would, all 12 of us would just get together and start brainstorming about it. Artists were allowed to have input on things that had nothing to do with art. Programmers and designers and things had input on things that had nothing to do with programming or design. We worked as a little community. We were all creative, intelligent, and funny people. I mean, it was an unbelievable, enjoyably, unbelievably enjoyable group of people to simply hang out with. Um, really unusually dynamic and charismatic people. So we had these fabulous conversations. Um, so when you ask how was Loom presented to me, well, we were gathered together, all of us, <clears throat> and told, you know, introduced to Brian 
and told that the next game was going to be Loom. And Brian got up and basically Brian said, this whole game is is really inspired by the music of Tchaikovsky. Um, it's it's about it's inspired by Swan Lake. And then he began going into it. And Brian was just a very creative designer. I mean, the idea that it was all going to be about music and that the interface was going to be a musical staff and you were going to be using notes, both visually, you know, written music and audible music to navigate the game. Everybody's going, what? You know, where's the point and click inventory? Where's the, you know, where, where are the dialogue choices? And I, you know, in the end, we had all those things, but um it was a really unusual game. And I don't know. I was never told, to my knowledge. I don't know to what extent people's awareness of this transition from solid EGA colored games to dithered EGA games and the kind of imagery that that made possible. I don't know whether that played any part in deciding to do such an artistic, thoughtful, sober and philosophical game it's possible there was some synergy there between look if games if our games are going to start to look like this then we can start thinking about something besides zany comic type storylines um brian was a very deep thinker and a very artistic sensitive um guy and maybe he just looked at that art and said, my moment has come. I don't know. I'm, I'm just speculating here. But everybody thought it was really interesting. And then they, they looked at me at the meeting and said, and this is going to be a dithered EGA game. So we want you to take the lead. What Gary, the art director, told me was that he, he sort of recommended that we look at the artwork of Ivan Darrell, um, who was a Disney artist at the time, famous for his uh, in his backgrounds in uh, Sleeping Beauty and, you know, some of those movies, very sort of angular graphic style. But he also did a lot of fine art, you know, uh, landscape things and things in this kind of style. And they're very striking. And they're, they're very, they, they're very stylized to the sense that you get the kind of impressionist sense of real space and real light and real air, but it's all in these very geometric sort of symbolic elements. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting kind of art. And Gary kind of said, I, I, I would like it to sort of reflect this sensibility. So I spent a lot of time looking at and, and thinking about the artwork of Ivan Errol and I think it really affected the way we drew trees, the way we, the sort of shapes and compositional, sort of geometric compositional sensibilities that we did. I Fortunately, I loved the work of Ivan Errol, so it was easy for me to get excited about doing this. But the thing that was most exciting was that I could now dither my heart out. So you could have a glass city that looked like green glass and you could have something that looked like atmospheric perspective where colors in the foreground were dark and more saturated and colors in the background because I could dither now, I could make lighter, less saturated colors that were still hue appropriate um, in the background. And so you could get a background that looked far away and, um, you know, you could, you could get a sense of the weather and the light. All of these things, we really were not able to get in Zach McCracken uh, or games like that. Um, so for me, this is, this is when EGA pixel art went from being frustrating to being a fabulous creative challenge that had me thoroughly engaged and engrossed. And uh, I think I, I think that was the game that first used the EGA pixel Lucasfilm Chrome logo that sort of sparkles as the light goes across it. I think that I also drew and designed that version of the Lucasfilm logo. Um, Cause I just looking, looking for things you could do with these 16 colors in this resolution format. Um, 
you know, the, the, the swan lake in the stars and just how many different kinds of effects can I get out of this? And finding ways to use dither patterns to fade from one color to a next that allowed for a, a different feel to those fades. And yeah, it was just, it suddenly became a really creative, really satisfying exploratory process rather than kind of a limiting, okay, I've got two options. They're both terrible. Which one should I choose kind of thing, which had, had been my first experience. Having said though, though, I want to make it clear. It was so enjoyable to work with the people I was working with that it was a pleasure to be there every day, even when we were doing Zach McCracken. The art wasn't what I wanted it to be, but the work was just so amazing with those people and and with the storytelling and all the rest of that that went on. Well, it wasn't your fault. It was the limitations of the time. Well, yes. And that's another thing. I, don't, I guess this is as good a time as any to get to this. I am very, very interested and intrigued by pixel art and pixel artists today. I have a lot of favorites and spend a lot of time looking at other people's pixel art. But as I have gotten to know the pixel art community some, mostly on Twitter, um, it has become very clear that the one of the biggest changes between when I was doing pixel art and when they're doing pixel art is that when we were doing pixel art, I don't think any of us chose to do pixel art because we loved pixels or the aesthetic or anything else. We did pixel art because we were all talented artists in other more traditional media and the technical limitations of the platform simply made it impossible to do anything else. So pixels were something we were constantly working to overcome. It was like a war between us and pixels and we were constantly trying to beat pixels into submission and win. <laughs> Now you have a whole worldwide community of artists who are doing pixel art because they love the aesthetic and pixels. It has become an actual art movement and the work that they're doing because of the fact that that work is not in spite of the pixels, it's about the pixels, is a lot of it spectacular work from an artistic standpoint. I mean, just from an abstract artistic, artistic standpoint, not just from a narrative illustration standpoint. Um, These people live and breathe pixels. And now I believe you're going to meet my wife. Mm -hmm. Hi, Shannon. Hi. Grab Hi. some lunch. <laughs> Back in a minute. Bye. Enjoy. Shannon's office is on one side of my office and the door to the rest of the house is on the other side. So you will see her come back through in a minute. She can't no enter problem. or leave her office without walking through mine. <laughs> so now you've met my That's wife, funny. the light of my life. About uh, Ivan Earl, the graphics in Loom were inspired by Sleeping Beauty, like you said. Was and, his, the, and his landscape, his fine art landscape work. And was the color palette also affected by it? Or was the co color palette something you chose to use yourself? A lot of the color palettes in his work weren't directly transferable because of the limitation of EGA colors I was working with. Um, he did oak forest landscape, fine art landscape work that was mostly greens and blacks with some blue where sky was available. And I could have done that in this, but the whole game would have had to have been green, blue, and black. And, you know, we, had and wanted to use these other colors. So um, I think what I tried to do was make, well, what I always tried to do was make the game as beautiful as possible. So in the background of a lot of the pastoral scenes, for instance, the trees aren't just green, they're blue and red and yellow. I mean, first of all, all those colors are in trees, you know, I mean, a, an ornamental plum is a very red tree at any time of year. So quite apart from autumn colors, there, there are plants with all sorts. And this was not earth, 
whatever this was, it was not earth. So I did not feel constrained to make all trees green uh, in any way. Yeah, there you go. Here are the trees. So another principle of just basic color composition, contrast kind of illustration craft is that the balance between warm colors and cool colors in a drawing is important. Uh, having some amount, so warm by warm colors, I mean sort of the fiery kind of color, part of the color wheel, yellow, orange, red. By cool colors, I mean the kind of blue watery part of the color wheel, blue, green, purple. Um, it is, in my opinion, more interesting to have at least some both warm and cool colors in a picture. Usually there's a majority of one or the other and focal spots of, of the other. So the picture may be mostly cool colors with focal spots of warm color. The picture may be mostly warm color with focal spots of cool color, but that contrast between warm and cool really adds another level of interest to the image. Um, the difference between saturated and unsaturated colors, that contrast, the use of that can also add or subtract visual punch from a picture. So I was going for scenes that used both saturated and unsaturated colors and warm and cool colors. And so if you look at this scene and imagine it with all that blue levels of mountain range and green grass and blue hills in the distance and then green trees, it would be much less interesting if it weren't for those big slices of red passing through all that cool green, blue, purple color. Um, yeah, you even have purple trees in the background. Yes. And of course, I was also going for atmospheric perspective with very few basic colors to work from. So all of those. So as things recede into the distance on this planet in our atmosphere with a sun, our the color of ours, um, as things recede into the distance here, they become lighter because of the way light travels through the atmosphere between you and the object. They become lighter. They become, they tend to become bluer and they become less saturated. So I was trying to make sure that foreground were highly saturated and darker colors and that the backgrounds were bluer, less saturated and lighter in value. Um, to do that, I usually had to use most of the cooler colors dithered with white or with lighter cooler colors. We had a, a light blue and a dark blue and a light cyan and a, a sort of, and a light cyan, I think, and white. And out of those four colors, I had to make all of the blues and uh, aqua colors that you see in the background. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers of receding lighter and lighter, cooler and cooler and less and less saturated layers of background back there. Those seven or eight layers are made out of three colors and white. Um, so having used up so much achieving the atmospheric perspective in the background, I really had to use the rest of them in the foreground. So, uh, and Ivan Errol actually used a lot of color that sort of surprising color choices to make the landscape more interesting and more interpretive. So yeah, I didn't, uh, I was more concerned with using warm and cool, saturated and unsaturated and lighter and darker with atmospheric perspective than I was concerned about what color things are in the real world. Does that make sense? Now, yeah. Now you mentioned that uh, CRT screens were blurry enough to cause yes. the dithering to appear like a gradient color. Now That's on the right, right you can see how it looks in today's uh, computer screens. And on the left, it's um, one of the screenshots of the cover art of the back of the right. package. So you can see that they photographed it on a CRT screen. So you can see that you can see the dithering of the mountains in the background. It actually looks like background um, that's fading away, like you said, yeah. with atmospheric perspective. Mm hmm. So the CRT blurring helped us in a lot of ways. In fact, we relied on it sometimes to blend colors and to blend shading for us. But 
honestly, I find the image on the right where you can see all the pixels and all the colors are so defined and bright, I find that picture visually more interesting. And I think that that's what disappeared. And that's what disappeared when they did the VGA conversion with so many just sort of muddier gradients is this kind of sharp graphic punch that the, that the right-hand picture has here. Mm -hmm. Now, when you started using dithering in Loom, oh, okay. uh, did, other, did other artists who work on the game, like Steve Purcell, uh, use the same methods? Did they consult <laughs> you before using them? Because, for example, we see this picture of Hatchel, and on the right, you can see that it also used dithering for yes. The well, close -up certainly, once Lucasfilm made the modifications to their engine that allowed for the use of Dither, and we started doing Dithered games, everybody started using Dither. But Dither was kind of my brainchild, and Steve Purcell, actually, <laughs> I think this happened while we were working on Secret of Monkey Island, actually, but uh, I was doing... Uh, a scene in Secret of Monkey Island where I, there was a, a, a jungle foreground on a vista overlooking uh, receding ridges of jungle and off to the coast mm -hmm. at the island. Mm -hmm. So I was using a lot of atmospheric perspective. And one of the members of the art team came into the office and Steve Purcell was there too while I was working in that scene. And when the other artist came in, Steve said, don't look, you'll go blind. Um, he seemed to feel that what I was doing was just kind of incomprehensible magic of some kind, how I was drawing all of these things. It was very different than the way they had drawn them before Dither and some of my other techniques sort of came along. Um, so yes, they used Dither. However, I was pretty much the background artist for Loom. Uh, I don't think many, if any, of the Loom backgrounds were done by anybody else. The other artists on this project were mostly doing character art and things, so they didn't yeah. actually need to use Dither the way I was using Dither. Uh, and it was perfectly fine for the characters um, to look a little different than the backgrounds uh, because they weren't actually part of the backgrounds. So I think... I think that others all did more with Dither because they could, and for a lot of the same reasons, they were happy to. But I think that nobody even wanted to, nobody was obsessed with what could be done with Dither like I was. Um, well, in this close-up image, you can see that they use Dither for the shadow and it makes it more realistic when you look mm -hmm, at it at yeah. the CRT screen. Right. Well, yes, it, it made a lot of things possible in terms of shading and coloring that had not been possible when all we could use was solid EGA colors. Now, in addition to the artwork that you did for Loom, did you know that there were some scenes that were removed from the final game? No, I didn't for, know that. For, for example, these scenes, which I presume you've worked on, uh, I certainly did the one in the upper left-hand corner, and I think I recognize the other two. It was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Were all of these removed? All of these were removed. They changed, presumably you changed the way that the um, that this island looked like in the final game. This looks okay, very so different you, in the when, final when, game. When you say the final game, do you mean the final EGA game or do you mean yeah, the final in the EGA VGA game. games? Oh, and this well. this entire section was changed because they the structure of the buildings was different in the final game, and I presume oh, you made the, the final art. Oh, well, and yes, I'm the... I'm sure I made the final art. I mean, probably what happened. I mean, you know, we're now talking about a level of. Uh, um, detail in terms of what happened that's just too long ago for me to remember. Uh, but I would imagine that what happened is that they ended up realizing that some of the game dynamics, the game play dynamics needed to be changed. Uh, and yeah. if they needed to be changed, it was for good reasons because Ron Gilbert knew what the hell he was doing. Uh, that's yeah, for it sure. It wasn't because of the way it looked. Um, no, Brian no, Moriarty everybody was had fine with Brian Moretti had a postmortem back in 2015, and mm -hmm. from which these screenshots were taken, 
And he mentioned that the reason why this whole scene was changed was because in the top right, you can see that there is a puzzle that they removed from the final game. So they right. had to change it. Right. And at the bottom, you can see that this room was also changed because, again, it was a puzzle created with, uh, which was supposed to be a mirror puzzle in which you mm -hmm. should have moved from side to side and it was too confusing. So that was removed as well. Right. Yeah. So yeah, gameplay issues. And that's not unusual. Gameplay issues often come up later in the game that make it necessary to go back and revise art. So I'm not surprised that happened. And yes, I'm sure I'm the guy who did the revisions, but I wouldn't have been the guy who decided on that. That wasn't, I wasn't the designer. Uh, so, or the, you know, I wasn't the guy who would have, would have been inventing the puzzles. Now, unfortunately, the EGA version hasn't been available for purchase online. And even when the game was made available on digital distribution platforms back in 2009, it was just the VGA version. Mm -hmm. Now, back in January, Limited Run Games uh, started working on a collector's edition of Loom. Mm. Now, when the collector's edition was announced, uh, the first thing that people asked was, will the EGA version be included? And it seems that for most people, including myself, the EGA version is the definitive version of Loom. Now, it may seem at first that it's just people being nostalgic and wanting to play the version they played as kids, but that's not the case. The uh, EGA yeah. version is, is far superior and far more immersive, in my opinion, than the VGA version. Why do you think the VGA version lost, um, lost the charm of the original EGA version? Uh, I think that the EGA version had more graphic punch because all of the colors had to be used very intentionally. I mean, every pixel we put on those screens was a considered decision. The artists who translated that for the VGA version, I mean, A, it wasn't their art. B, they were trying to reproduce something, not create something. And there's a difference there. There's a difference in interest. There's a difference in enjoyment. And there's a difference in understanding what you're drawing. If you're creating art from nothing, you have reasons for everything you draw. If you're just copying something, you may have no idea why it was drawn that way. All you're trying to do is say, okay, how do I, how do I copy this? So there's a, there's a real, there's far less far less vision, ownership, or reasoning behind copied art than there is created art. And uh, I mean, for instance, as, so refresh my this memory is for here. Example, this the, is, the, for example, the first scene of Loom. And the mm -hmm. top image is the entire landscape of the EGA version. And the bottom mm -hmm. image is the entire landscape of the VGA version. Right. Well, I like what they've done with the gray stones in the bottom version. Are you sure the bottom version is the VGA version? Yep. Okay. I like what they've done because it was something I wanted to do, which was the, the watermarks on the rocks there. Uh, but yeah, that's the VGA version. So yeah, I actually prefer some of the things they did here. And of course they had more colors to work with, but, um, you know, yeah, the thing that I, Brian Moriarty mentioned that, you know, he considers the EGA version as the definitive version as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason why he mentions this scene is because in your uh, EGA version, the leaf is the only thing that stands out in that scene. Well, right. in the VGA version, the leaf blends in the background and you barely notice it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, of course, was done intentionally. Brian made it very clear that he wanted that leaf to stand out. And the easiest way to do that was to make it the only warm color in a cool drawing. So and you have to remember that I don't believe anybody ever saw this whole panorama like you're looking at it now. I think that there was a window of screen space that followed the mm -hmm. character around. So you only saw little bits of this at a time. So there are things happening in the VGA version here that make for a far more interesting overall picture. Uh, 
that would have been mostly irrelevant when all you ever saw was little postage stamp parts of that picture at any given moment. Uh, whoever did this was really cognizant of the overall composition. And um, I wasn't thinking in those terms because I knew that no one was ever going to see the overall composition. But I know I, in this I case, I have to say, it. I like the VGA. But in general, I think that the the mindfulness that was necessary to do these images in EGA made for sharper, more intentional images. And I think that when the people copied them, they just copied them without really understanding why they were doing what they were making the choices they were making about color and contrast and saturation and shading. They just were copying. And one of the things that definitely happened in the EGA versions is that the way they seem to have been approaching rendering light and shadow on things was just mm -hmm. light to dark. If there's a brown rock, the highlight part of the rocks are lighter brown and the shadow parts are darker brown or black. And it's the same brown from white to black. But that's not how light actually works. Light, we live on a planet with a blue sky and a yellow star and direct sunlight isn't just lighter than shade it's yellower and shade is not just darker than direct sunlight it's bluer and the reason for that is that direct sunlight things are being lit up by a yellowish light from a yellow star it may look blindingly white to our eyes but it's actually a warm light source hue wise but shade to the extent that it's being illuminated i mean obviously shadows are not just black holes in which you see nothing um, shade is an area that isn't getting the yellow light from the sun, but is being lit up by blue bounce light from the blue sky. So highlights to shadows, there isn't just a value shift from light to dark. There's also usually a color shift of some kind. There's a color shift from whatever the hue family of the light source is to whatever bounce light is filling the shadow areas. And there were so the gradients they were using in the VGA version were just light brown to dark brown with no color shift. Um, and that made things look kind of flat and lightless a lot of times, ironically. Um, even though things were rendered with highlights and shadows, there was no sense of light there because there was no color shift, no saturation shift, um, particularly daytime scenes. Uh, and actually, I guess I'm actually the things I'm remembering now were probably from Monkey Island, not from Loom, from the VGA conversion of Monkey Island. So that wouldn't now, have the been thing as is, big a the deal thing here. is that in in from my perspective, the the message you were trying to convey with the original version was of a gloomy world, while the VGA version seems more hopeful, like the beginning of a new day. And I right. feel like it missed the entire atmospheric uh, sense that the EGA version had. I think what I wanted to convey in the original version was a mysterious world. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it was gloomy because of the palette that I had to work with. I just didn't actually have the capacity to make a lot of the colors in that beautiful sunburst in the VGA version there. I didn't have those purples, those oranges or even that yellow, and I couldn't really dither them very well. The closest I could come to doing that in EGA was the sunset we saw at, at the Pirate Town in Secret of Monkey Island. Mm -hmm. That sunset was pretty much an homage to the original Twilight, you know, hills covered with oak trees image that I left on my screen the day that Lucasfilm began making the transition to, eat, to dithered art to begin with. Um, and that was the best I could do. I could not have done the beautiful burst of color um, at the horizon in the VGA version here with the EGA palette, even with dithering. So they are doing things I might have done because I don't think I wanted Loom to be gloomy. I think I wanted to, to be shadowy and mysterious, but I think that the palette that I had was a pretty much blue palette. Blues, blues were the strongest colors in the EGA palette, because you actually had three or four of them. Uh, everything else, you just had two. And one of those was usually a useless acid fluorescent color. So 
you you just had more blues. And probably one of the reasons I made Loom a blue, shadowy, mysterious place wasn't just because it went well with the story, but because I had more color to work with in that color family than any of the others. So I made the basic world to go with the colors I had most of. If I'd needed atmospheric perspective happening in reds and oranges, I'd have been in sad luck even with dither getting things to fade away like that. But at the same time, I think that what you saw like in those pastoral scenes with the red trees and all the rest of this, this was my attempt to lighten things up, not to make a whole world that was just blue shadows. Loom won a special award for artistic achievement from Computer Gaming World. I remember. Were I didn't you... even understand what that meant when they told me. They, they came back from that. Uh, was this at the... Uh, um, Gen the... Genesis convention or what what it was it called? Do you know what I'm talking from about? From Computer Gaming World. Okay. They came back from some convention and they had plaques, mm -hmm. award plaques with them, and they gave one to me. I still have it. Um, and they said, congratulations. And I said, I was working on some art at the time in Gary's office. And I said, wow, that's great. Thank you. And I guess I didn't seem all that excited. And Brian said, you know, this is a big deal. And I said, well, oh, good. I had no idea what it meant. I had no idea. I mean, I was still so new to the whole thing at that point. I was still interested in the art. I was glad that somebody out there was giving me awards, but I, I didn't really know who they were and I didn't really know why it mattered. And I think Brian was kind of appalled by the fact that I didn't understand what this meant, but I didn't really. Uh, in fact, that sort of characterized a lot of my career is I am very into doing the best artwork I can do, and that's the task I get engaged in. And I don't pay a lot of attention to the rest of the things attached to all of that. And sometimes that's a problem. Sometimes that makes me difficult to work with because I, I end up ignoring things I really should be paying attention to. Um, um, well, with the work you yeah. produce, I, I think it's a good idea to ignore everyone. Well, it, 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 is until it's, it is until it's not, yeah. <laughs> now, after Loom was released, um, Brian Moriarty wanted to make a trilogy out of it, but it didn't pan out in the end. And yeah. during my conversation with Bill Tiller, he mentioned that you created some artwork for the sequel, The Forge. Is that true? I don't think so. I did artwork for the forge scenes that appear in the original Loom game. Um, you know, there's a portion of the game that takes place in the Guild of the Smiths, and mm -hmm. there's a giant anvil castle where they work, and, you know, all of those scenes are done in the various reds and yellows that were available to me at the time. Um, but I don't remember doing any test art. Now, it doesn't mean I didn't do it. I'm 66 years old now. I was 30 something when I worked for them. So I've forgotten enough to fill shelves of books in the last 30 years. It's possible I did that, but I don't have any memory of doing sample art for a second game. Okay. Do, do you happen to know whether that second game was explored before or after Lucasfilm games became LucasArts games? No, it was during the Lucasfilm days. And oh, really? There hmm. were design documents for the Forge, so it was discussed, and the whole idea hmm. of the game was presented to people. So mm -hmm. the fact that there was concept art it made some sense. So did Brian but, say that? Did Brian say somewhere that I did concept art for the second no, game? No, Bill Tiller. I talked to Bill Tiller. Okay. He was an artist All who right. worked at, at LucasArts, and he said that right. he saw some concept art. Maybe it's another not true. Po another possibility is that they used some of my Forge art from the original EGA Loom game in the proposal for the second game. If that's the case, then yes, my artwork would have been used in that game, but it wouldn't have been artwork I did later and specially for uh, the pitch for the second game. Okay, moving on to The Secret of Monkey Island. Mm -hmm. How uh, did you first hear about the project? 
I guess you guys had a meeting, all of you. Yeah. And I mean, at the beginning, every time it was time to start a new project, pretty much all of us got together to hear about it and to talk about it and to find out who was going to be doing what. And yeah, it was, uh, it was a whole lot more like episodes of Spanky and the gang than it was like a software company today. It was fun and creative, but yes, we, we were all gotten together and we were all told what was happening now. And I mean, this game was Steve Purcell's dream. I mean, talking monkeys and everything. This was, this was right down Steve's, alley so i did a very significant chunk of the backgrounds in that game but there were whole parts of the game where steve did the backgrounds steve purcell did the backgrounds the monkey village and uh, a number of the, the pirate ship the interiors of the pirate ship and the docks and that was all steve purcell and by that time dithered art was not the strange new language that it had been in loom and by that time we'd all come to our own special brands of it uh we agreed to divvy up the backgrounds so that steve was doing all the background work for certain locations and i was doing all the background work for other locations because his dithered artwork and my dithered artwork did not look the same stylistically and that didn't matter you know if if the spooky forest or the monkey village or the interior of a pirate ship didn't look like the pirate town or um, or the jungle scenes, well, that's fine because they were different places. Of course, they look different. So as long as you divided up the artistic things at the edges of different locations, no one was going to, if they noticed at all, they weren't going to care. But if Steve had done a, a couple jungle scenes and I'd done a couple jungle scenes, or if Steve had done you know, some of the monkey town, monkey village scenes, and I'd done some of the monkey village scenes, you would have noticed right away, wait a minute, this is flipping back and forth between two universes, what's going on here. So that was how we managed the sort of, how do you use dither issue from that point on was that we divided different artists across natural lines where the subject matter changed so much that it would seem perfectly natural that these scenes look different than other scenes. Now, speaking of dithering, here you can see at the top, you can see two images which show off the pier at the beginning of mm -hmm. The Secret of Monk Allen mm -hmm. with the sunset. And yep. after a while in the game, uh, something After a while, the sun happens. goes down, right. Yep. Yeah. Um, so in the VGA version, which you can see at the bottom, there was no sunset. It was always night. Yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> I mean, that sunset had personal significance. It had kind of historical significance in in the sense that that sunset is kind of what launched EGA dithered artwork for Lucasfilm altogether. And again, a scene with warm and cool colors in contrast is certainly more interesting than a scene with just all blues. So I think they missed a trick in this one. So Plus, the image at I mean, the top is what you created by... and the image at the top is what you created back in the day to show off Ditter? Well, the image was inspired by the image that I created to show off Ditter. The image that I created to show off Ditter was just a bunch of receding ridge lines covered in live oak forest and you know, a moon in the sky and everything. Um, so it was a different picture, but the image I created with these receding hill lines and trees had pretty much the same sunset in it. So when it came time to do the pirate village, I just recreated that sunset for the pirate village. But we did want time to pass during the game. We didn't want people, you know, there were scenes later in the game that, that, uh, that, um, Ron clearly wanted to be night scenes. And we mm -hmm. didn't want people going to scenes of full night elsewhere on the island eventually, and then coming back to the pirate village and the sun was still setting. That was just dumb. So we really needed to have two versions so that people could enjoy the sunset at the beginning of the game. And then once night fell for the rest of it, they could come back and night will have fallen everywhere. So. Well, they probably missed the that scenes. point in the VJ conversion. Did they, yeah. That was too did bad. Did they actually consult you? 
about no. any of the VGA conversions? No, no, I, I didn't even know there were VGA conversions till many years later. I mean, I have to say, I have to, uh, to emphasize the point. I was an artist before I worked at Lucasfilm. I came to Lucasfilm and went on being an artist. I mean, focused on being an artist. Eventually, I left Lucasfilm for various reasons to be an artist elsewhere. It wasn't until I literally ran into a truck on my mountain bike when in 2000 and had a brain injury that I stopped being a visual artist because my head stopped talking to my hand for a while, for a long while, um, in some ways. Uh, it was, but it was always about art for me. It really wasn't about games. It wasn't about computers. So the, one of the results, and, and, and not a great result in some ways, is that I was always very detached from that angle of things. Once the art was done, I went on to something else and lost interest. I just wasn't paying attention. So no, I didn't know there were VGA conversions. And here's how big the separation was. In the early, in the very, like 1999 and the early 2000s, I pretty much left the industry entirely for reasons we might want to get into later. I left the industry entirely for a number of years and did other things, um, largely to do with the advent of 3D CAD rendered art and how that rendered pixel artists and hand artists of any kind kind of irrelevant for a while. There just really wasn't work for me all of a sudden. I had been one of the it guys for quite a while by then. And then suddenly everybody was doing 3D rendered cat art and there was just no reason to hire me for that. The machine was doing the rendering and you couldn't tell my art from anybody else's art because the machine was doing the actual rendering. So mm -hmm. I left the industry for probably five or six years. And then by accident, I mean, maybe I'll tell this story later, I don't know, but by accident, I ran into somebody running a games division of a large subcontractor in the Seattle area who was astonished to find out that I was still alive and asked if I would work for him, like starting tomorrow. And that's when I found out that small handheld devices and phones now were powerful enough to run games like what had used to be PC desktop games when I was you know, much earlier in my life. And that now they needed pixel art again, because these devices were not powerful enough to run console games with their 3D rendered art. They needed 2D pixel art again, and nobody remembered how to do it anymore. So would I work for him? So I took a job at this company, kind of amazed. We'll get to, to, that. Suddenly... We'll yeah. get to that in a second. I yeah, just okay. want to go back and finish the LucasArts days. All right. And... Um, you worked after after that you worked on Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Well, I did and I didn't. You know, this is a <laughs> this is a an interesting memory is a tricky or thing you? for everybody. I did a series of backgrounds for that game that had Indy falling through the ceilings and through the floors of mm -hmm. a succession of rooms filled with artifacts and things. I believe yeah. it was intended as a credits sequence or an intro yeah, sequence or something intro. like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am still not sure. Just after doing that sequence of screens is when I left Lucasfilm. So I did not actually work on the game. I just worked on that one sequence before I left. And I have never been sure whether the sequence I did is the actual sequence that ended up in the game or whether those were redone by whatever artists did the rest of the art for that game. So if I worked on that game, it was only that one sequence. And if they didn't use that sequence or if they had it redone by the artists who did the rest of the game, then maybe technically I didn't work on that game at all. It's unclear. First of all, you're credited on the game. So, All right, then, then then they must have used my sequence. Okay. You should accept the credit as is. All right, that's and, a mystery solved. Thanks. And, and and the second thing, why why guess when you can? I presume you haven't played the game, so it's true. Watch, I have not played the game. Let's watch the intro. So this is the intro. Wait. So you see, he picks up things and he falls through. 
this trap door to this room. Okay. I did that room. Okay. And then he picks, moves the crate and then falls through this door to the I library. Definitely, I definitely did that game. I mean, that room. The library as well? Yeah, the library is the one I'm most sure about, yes. I'm not sure whether I did the first room, but I definitely so first, did this the one. The first room is this one. The first room is this one. Yeah, so. I don't remember. That That looks like it might have been me. Probably was me, but I, I don't remember it as clearly as I remember the next two. So I definitely, I probably did all three of those rooms. Okay, and after this, then you go on to this part where you fall through the floor to this room. Okay, yep, and I did this room, I think. Yeah, I remember this. And then you um, slide down the chute to this room. I don't remember whether I did this room or not. It kind of looks like my work, but it probably was my work. But some of these I remember more clearly than others. The one I remember most of all was the library. But I definitely did several rooms. Well, and this now, is the, don't, the game itself. Yeah. And I don't think I did that. So, okay. yeah. I so, think, mystery solved. Yeah. So, yes. I did a tiny amount of work on that game and got credited for it. But most of that game was other people. Well, because it's the best I had part moved of the on. game. Don't let anyone oh, tell you, you otherwise. Oh, well, that's very nice of you. Yes. Now, as you said, after, after Fate of Atlantis or during Fate of Atlantis, um, you left LucasArts. Why did you decide to leave LucasArts? There were a number of reasons. Uh, I was living in the town of Mendocino, California at that time. That was a three and a half to four hour drive north. Um, my deal with Lucasfilm was that I could work remotely from home for most of the week at that time. And that was decades before remote work became a common thing. Um, but that I needed to come down for two or three days every week. So I was coming down once a week, every week for a couple of days, staying with uh, friends, including Ron Gilbert down there um, uh, or at a motel and working. And after a year or two, that was getting a little old. But uh, the, I think probably the primary reason that I moved along was that um, – was the dynamics around the shift from Lucasfilm games to LucasArts games. Uh, it was about that time when Luke, when I, th I think that George Lucas's empire had simply become too large and too much work for him to take such an active interest in all of it. So he began divvying up his many, many, the many, many different counties of his realm um, and handing off some of them to teams of, you know, people he hired to sort of take care of this so that he could go off and concentrate on other things. And one of the things he handed off was the games division. Um, and the people that he handed it off to, sorry, my camera's moving around. The, uh, the people he handed it off to soon made it pretty clear that their focal concerns were that the games division be far more profitable and efficient than it had been. And Lucasfilm Games had been in a cluster of faux farm buildings, a short walk from the Victorian Mansion Administrative Building on Skywalker Ranch, and suddenly all the games division was moved into hidden offices in a big insurance high rise in San, the city of San Rafael, uh, 20 minutes away or so. You walked in the front door of this insurance building and if you knew what you were doing, you, you knew which unmarked door to knock on and then there was a peephole and a camera and if you were somebody who belonged there, that door opened for you and if you weren't, it didn't. And that was all very nice, but inside was just cubicles, cubicles and office space. And it was, it was a pretty big downer. No more, 
lovely lunches at the mansion, no more driving to and from Skywalker Ranch, which was a very pleasant place. It was a much bigger division now full of people who were just there to work a lot of, I mean, we'd always been there to work. We worked incredibly hard because we loved what we did at the games division, but these were people who didn't necessarily love what they did. They were just there to do their job and get paid. And the collegiality was falling away and the sense of tremendous creativity and, and synergistic excitement was falling away. And then the people running the games division began to make examples of some of our game designers who were very creative people who'd done really important things and basically say, look, it's great that you're so creative, but you're wasting huge amounts of resources, you know, being creative. And some of those people were fired and others were just shamed. And I just thought, you know, I'd had by then my reputation had spread as a game artist. And I had other software companies and other software developers contacting me regularly. And I just told them, hey, I work for Lucasfilm and I am not really allowed to work for anybody else. So thank you very much. I'm honored to hear from you, but I cannot do this. And I thought, you know, lots of people want me to work for them and this isn't really fun anymore. Uh, I was still having to come down four hour drive from the town of Mendocino to work in an office building with people, half of whom weren't all that excited to be there. And some of the people that I admired most were being punished apparently for having wasted resources on speculative creativity. I mean, in all fairness, the venture capital bubble for computer games had ruptured at that point, And there wasn't the huge endless reservoir of venture capital money to spend that there had been. I'm not saying there weren't any reasons for this or that it was gratuitous, but it wasn't fun. So at that point, I told the people I'd been working for how much I had enjoyed this, how honored I was to have been involved. And thanks for all the fish, but it's time to leave. And uh, I went back to Mendocino and started working as a freelance uh, game illustrator for other clients. So that's, which, that's how I left. Which games that did point. you work on after you left LucasArts? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, I don't really remember a lot of them. None of them were very memorable games, but there was a bigger reason why I don't remember. After the rupture of the venture capital bubble, that had funded the original computer gaming industry. There was a giant rearrangement of that world. And part of that rearrangement was a proliferation of, you know, there were big gaming companies that were being put together to make huge amounts of money in very large ways. And then there was a large community of people who, to whom that did not appeal, including myself. And those people were all becoming independent developers. So there was a big explosion at that time, starting around that time of independent developers making small games um, on a small budget with, you know, only a few people or even only one person sometimes. And a lot of times those independent developers were doing much more interesting things. But a, they had smaller budgets. A lot of them couldn't really afford me, even though I was not charging anything like a lot of people thought I ought to be charging at that point. They couldn't afford me a lot of times. Um, a lot of times they started working on games and realized they just didn't have resources to see the game through and the game would end in the middle. So when I was hired by those, I, I often worked for those people because I was more intrigued by the things they were doing artistically and narratively and everything else. <clears throat> but a lot of times they hired me to be a concept artist rather than the actual game artist. They just wanted me to do sample screens so that they could hire artists they could afford to say, look, here's some pixel art. This is what it's supposed to look like. Try and do this. I, I feel for those guys, but I understood what they were doing. So I would do a few screens for a game that I had no further involvement with really after that from my home in Mendocino. 
or I would be hired to do the actual artwork for a game or artwork to pitch a game and the game would never actually make it all the way to production and release or the pitch would not go anywhere. And so for quite a few years, I became one of the most celebrated guys to hire if you had a game that you'd never actually intended to produce a release, but you needed artwork for, you needed, you needed artwork to not produce and release it. I was your guy. So I did a whole lot of art during those years that never actually ended up in a game that ever actually became anything. So there's only a few products that I can actually name because they actually became something for a while. Uh, two of the biggest were probably both put out by the same group. Uh, although under sort of different names, possibly. One was called Heaven and Earth. It was a collection of puzzle games. And one of them was called Seize the Day. Uh, and that was a calendar sort of journaling notebook type app. And those were the games in which I really developed more of what could be done with color cycling and what could be done with palette shifting in the uh, in the 8-bit VGA environment, uh, the Seize the Day product was the one that I did um, those color cycling, palette shifting landscapes in that change time of day seamlessly through a 24-hour cycle and the weather changes and you know all of that stuff. I did those all for a product called Seize the Day. I had discovered things you could do with D-Paint art and and palette shifting and color cycling to fully animate an entire environment full screen at a time where full screen animations were simply not supportable in a frame by frame sense because of lack of processing speed and um at storage uh and ways to shift that animation seamlessly through weather and time changes i mean i was I was just finding really, really innovative and creative ways to use the D-Paint tool. So a lot of people were paying me to use it, but a lot of them never made it to completion. Heaven and Earth did, Seize the Day did, and a really small product for a single guy, independent developer. His company was called Magic Mouse. His name was Edward, is Edward DeYoung. He made a little thing called Flying Colors just the most remedial thing ever in a lot of ways, but really a fun little tool. It was originally invented mostly for children, but I still today hear from adults, some of them very creative people who are thrilled to death uh, by this product still and are using it for all sorts of creative things. Um, Flying Colors was just a whole bunch of kind of generic backgrounds with nothing in them just wallpaper type backgrounds and then giant collections of stamps, you know, pixel art stamps that you could use stamp down on those backgrounds to create jungles or coral reefs or buildings or castles or, you know, things like this and all sorts of objects and animals and things to populate them with and all the rest of this. It became this giant library of component pixel art and he paid me very well, actually. Um, and the product was pretty successful for a while. And then he ran into people who wanted to take the idea and do bigger things with it, but didn't want to pay him for that. And um, it got into legal stuff. And we all, I at least moved on sooner than he did, but we all moved on eventually. Um, so those are three. I did concept art, I remember, for EA and for a number of other people, but all for either pitches that didn't go anywhere or for games that never actually made it all the way to release. And, um, and then in 2000, I rode my mountain bike around a sharp hairpin turn into the grill of an oncoming truck and discovered over the subsequent year as I was recovering that my head and my hand were no longer talking to each other the way they had before. And at that point, I made a shift from art to writing and began working as a fiction writer and a novelist. Uh, today, I still do digital illustration work and writing um, and editing, as does my wife, everything except for the artwork. And we have lots of work for lots of remote clients, which was great during the pandemic. 
Um, but, uh, with my, the, the exception came when I took a job with that subcontractor in Seattle. And then I spent almost seven years, I think, no, almost five years, I think, working for that subcontractor in Seattle, doing artwork for all sorts of 8-bit handheld platform type games. And some of that artwork was noteworthy too, but all for games that were not noteworthy. So for instance, Jack's Pacific had a little plug it into your TV handheld controller where the game is in the controller, sort of an X-Man game. I did some beautiful pixel art and some rather remarkable tricks with palette shifting uh, so that just by changing palettes, you could literally change from a whole different scene to a whole completely different scene with different things in it and everything just by shifting palettes. I, I did stuff like that for these games. I did artwork for the last in the GBA Spyro games. Um, the very last GBA platform Spyro game. I did all of the backgrounds for that and they were beautiful backgrounds, but it was the last game in a series for a dying platform. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time since I left Lucasfilm being paid very well to work for a lot of people. I, I used some of those color cycling, palette shifting backgrounds and a lot of other work for a, a, a Magic the Gathering game called Magic Battle Mage that was put out by Wizards of the Coast and Acclaim, but Wizards of the Coast and Acclaim used most of the production schedule fighting with each other in court about who owned what and had to pay what to whom, and that really held up our production schedule until finally we were given the last little slice of our production schedule to make the whole game when they'd resolve the legal issues, and it wasn't enough time, and the game was released with a patch kit because it was so not ready, and it was horribly reviewed, and it died on the vine and acclaim not long after it, if I recall correctly. So I've done a lot of work. I was paid very well, and a lot of that work has been really interesting artistically, which honestly was mostly what mattered to me. Because again, I wasn't all that interested in the games or the industry as much as I was just interested in making art in these interesting mediums. By then, I was all about how to push that frontier just a little further than I had last time. Um, but eventually everything changes and everything moves on. And, you know, when I've talked to you before about how out of touch I was, I, I never quite got to tell you the story about what happened when I took that last subcontracting job in Seattle. On my first day, he took uh, my, my, my new boss, took me around from cubicle to cubicle in a 300 person division. Uh, to start introducing me to a number of the people I'd be working with. So we'd go to a cubicle and he'd say, hi, this is a new guy. He'll be working for us. His name is Mark Ferrari. And on four or five occasions, the people in the cubicle, when he said my name, would look up and go, you're not the Mark Ferrari. And I had been out of the industry for seven years at that time, doing other things entirely. I had no idea what they meant. I said, well, the Mark Ferrari? I mean, Ferrari is actually a very common name. Ferrari means literally Smith in Italian. My name is Mark Smith in Italian. And Smith is as common in Italy as it is in any other place. So I figured it had to be some other Mark Ferrari. I say, so the Mark Ferrari. And then when I said, Secret of Monkey Island, Loom. And I said, how do you know about that? You weren't even born when I made those games. And oh, I grew up playing that game. That day was the day that I found out that Secret of Monkey Island and Loom were now regarded as classic video games. That was 2005. I had no idea until 2005 that those two games had become classics in the industry. I found out from these young people in these cubicles I was meeting on my first day at this new job at a subcontractor. So I didn't even know what had happened to these games. I didn't even know that anybody remembered them, much less that they still mattered. So. Yeah, I was in it for the art, and I didn't look up from the art much. Well, it seems like every time I talk to uh, someone who worked at LucasArts, they all, they were all under the same impression that these games were were made for a very specific time in history. So, for example, they released it in 1990. They didn't expect anyone after 1992 to even play them. 
um, That's right. let alone a decade after or two decades after that. And, and the moment that they started emulating uh, those games on modern machines, because a lot of the times the older games weren't compatible with modern machines. Yep, right. So when they started creating emulators, then people in the early 2000s started replaying these games after they couldn't play them for several years. So new people were exposed to these games and people who have played them as kids were able to um, play them again. So that's why 2005, David Fox, for example, told me that in 2004, he went to a convention and there he found out how popular Zach McCracken was with people yeah. in Europe, for example. Right, right. I don't think we knew. And you're absolutely right. Nobody at Lucasfilm when I was there thought that we were making classic games of tremendous historic importance. We were just at a neat job in a neat place doing really neat work as w with all of the excitement and the interest that we could. Everybody brought a real passion for what they were doing, whether it was programming or, you know, storytelling or design or art, we all really had a passion for what we were doing. And we were just doing what we were doing as well as we could because we loved doing it. We just figured we were making games. And yes, everybody assumed that after that, we'd make more games, more games and the games we were making would be forgotten. But it didn't matter. We weren't there to be remembered for the ages. We were there to do something fun right now. And we were doing it. So. I think that the others, a lot of the others, I mean, certainly Ron Gilbert was paying attention. So were a lot of other people. They they were paying attention enough to realize what happened in spite of the fact that none of us had foreseen that. I just wasn't paying attention. I was just, you know, head down doing more art for more people because I love the art. And when I did finish the art, most of it I forgot about. Now, eventually I did play a lot of those games. Um, but I didn't actually play Loom. Or I didn't actually play uh, Secret of Monkey Island until someone at that subcontractor who had been playing this game all his life gave me uh, a DOS emulator and a copy of the original EA EGA version and said, now you can play it. So I played it on my work machine eventually using an emulator. Um, and that's how I saw, wow, it's really a fun game. <laughs> but yeah, I am... I am pretty clueless uh, about an awful lot of what the rest of you are excited about. I just wasn't paying attention. Yeah, it, it, it seems like we're analyzing and sometimes overanalyzing these games and every aspect of them from the artwork to the dialogue to everything mm -hmm. for decades. And for you guys, it was a typical Tuesday. I went to work. This was the background I did. Didn't think too much of it. The end. Actually, I don't know. I don't think there were any typical Tuesdays on Skywalker Ranch at Lucasfilm in the late 80s. I think that we may have thought we were working on a typical game, but our Tuesdays were not typical. I think we really <laughs> understood not only that we enjoyed being there and doing what we were doing, but I think we understood that we were in a very special place working with very special people. I loved that job every day. I've never loved a job as much as I loved the three years that I spent working for Lucasfilm Games. Um, I mean, who knew that my first job would be the peak of my career? <laughs> and it would all be downhill from there. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't think any of us had the typical Tuesday mindset. I think that we didn't expect the games that we were working on to matter to other people as much or as long as they did. Uh, but... We all understood that our situation and our task and the community of people we were working with were special. Uh, and we all enjoyed and appreciated that fact virtually every day in those days. Well, maybe the fact that you were having fun on a daily basis is what made these games great. Because it shows... We were. We were having fun. We were having fun every day. We were laughing a great deal and, you know... During our lunch break, if we weren't, if we had time left over after going to the lovely buffet in that dining room, you know, those guys would put their Indiana Jones leather jackets on and go practice with their bullwhips behind the office. I mean, we were into what we were doing and we were into each other. So it was, uh, it was definitely golden, even at the time. Uh, we just had no idea 
that all of this would still matter 20 or 30 years later. Now, after you said that after 2005, you worked on several titles, but most of them were licensed games. Did you feel the fact that you're working on licensed games to limit you in any way artistically? No, licensed games didn't limit me, but, <laughs> but big industry agendas did hugely. So let me, let me tell you some, some scandalous stories. Um, about the way big business left me very disenchanted with this whole arena. I think I'll start with sort of a quintessential one. I was hired by this big subcontractor in Seattle, as I mentioned, which no longer exists, by the way. Um, I was hired to be, you know, sort of their master pixel artist for this 300 person division, because I was a legend from the past where people knew how to do this. So the first thing they put me on, and I'm fine with just using the name of the company, we were subcontracting this game for Jack's Pacific, which was a big international kind of cheap toy maker. And uh, they gave us they wanted to do a, a handheld game in controller, plug into your TV X-Men game when the X-Men were big back then. And they gave us a pretty tiny little budget and a, a short little production schedule to do an X-Men game for this rinky dink little hand controller game. But so the division, you know, with this tiny budget and this tiny production schedule, we didn't put a big team together or anything. They put a six person team together. There were, there was me and I think uh, one or two, I guess there was me, there was one, I was doing all the backgrounds. There was one character animator, there was a designer and there was one or two, you know, a couple programmers. That was it. And they expected us to make a rinky dink little game. But this was my first job at this company that I'd been hired for being a pixel wizard at. And both the designer and our animator were fanatic X-Men fans and fanatic 8-bit uh, game fans. And we all decided that we wanted to make the world's most kick-ass little handheld controller game, X-Men game ever in history. And we knew that we had very little time and very little money, but we were all very good at what we did. And this was my first project at the company. so. Not only did I do a lot of really beautiful background art for that thing, but this was the game with a single 256 color palette where I figured out there was so little storage space on this tiny little chip inside that handheld controller to contain the entire game that everything had to be really small storage wise. So this is where I figured out how to take a single background for one of our games, one of the five games in that controller suite, take a single picture and using palette and construct that picture pixel wise so that by shifting palettes, you could get nine completely different pictures out of that one picture just by shifting palettes. So we didn't have to store nine pictures. We just had to store one picture and nine palettes. And I did it in a couple of days and then I showed it to my team and there was like upheaval in the division. Everybody was coming. I was accused of witchcraft. I mean, it was, it just didn't seem possible. And the, to cut to the chase sort of here, we finished an amazingly beautiful and amazingly enjoyable and amazingly innovative game inside that short production schedule with that tiny budget and sent it off to Jack Specific, expecting to hear expressions of amazement with what we'd accomplished with what they'd given us. Here's what we got. We got a, well, we didn't get it. The division head got a really angry phone call from the guy in charge of this project at Jack Specific. And he said, this is not what we talked about. This is not what we described and it is not what we asked for. What the hell were you thinking? And the division head said, uh, you're not happy with this game? It seemed pretty good to me. And the guy goes, yeah, 
It's way too good. This is not what we wanted. It's not what we discussed. And do you understand what you guys have done here? And he said, no, we made you a kick-ass game for almost no money in no time. What have we done? And he explained to the division head, who I guess should have understood this, that this was part of a line of handheld controller games they'd been selling for a couple years now. And this game was so much better than all of the other games in that line that once people saw this game, they were going to lose interest in the entire rest of the line. Nor would they be able to get any more games of this quality, probably. So what we had just done is destroy the value of the rest of the line by making this one way too good. And that if we had paid attention to what they were asking for and the budget and the production schedule, we should have understood that they didn't want something that was going to be head and shoulders better than the rest of the line it was part of. So we apologized for the spectacular, well, we didn't, the division head apologized for the spectacular job we'd done and we were told to dumb things down in the future. Seriously? So, no, yes. So. And this is not the only time this has happened. I mean, I will also tell you that Gary Winnick and I worked together briefly on some other things many years later, and we were in a car together going to some meeting somewhere when we discovered that we had both been working, he and I, on game, on game ideas of our own that might actually be compatible and combinable into a really impressive kind of game. And we started talking about how to join his idea and my ideas together into this really great game. But then the conversation devolved into 20 minutes of discussing how to make our game look less remarkable and less unique and original and more like other games because of all the problems that would be involved by making a game that was actually too different and and or too much better than the games other games made by people we were going to pitch it to and finally just decided never mind so you know these are two stories two i mean i could tell you dozens i'm not going to waste people's time with more of them but these are two stories about the way that the monetization of computer games and computer gaming made mediocrity the necessary standard from a profitability standpoint the necessary standard of computer games. And the ultimate result was, I mean, it was all about how to maximize the amount of money and minimize the amount of investment. After a certain point, it, the entire industry was about that. And the formula they came up with is sell the idea, not the game, put as little into the product as possible and as much into the packaging and advertising as you can, and then sell the idea, structure your whole profit loss business plan around the number of sales that you can make within two or three months after the release of the game. If you have done your advertising and your packaging correctly, you will sell so many, you know, you build a tremendous amount of hype and anticipation for the game you will sell so many copies of that game in the first few months that by the time word gets around that there's nothing in the box but dirt, you will have sold enough to make a handsome profit and you can just drop that game and go on and do it again with a new concept, with new packaging and new advertising. At that point, they actually began to cut down further and further what they paid the people who made the game, what kind of game they wanted made. All of that got less and less and less while the advertising and the packaging got more and more and more. And they made money hand over fist. But one of the essential ingredients in that business model was that you had to do everything you could to make sure that nothing else got on the market from somebody else that was head and shoulders better than your stuff because people would only go on buying the next mediocre thing after the last mediocre thing and the mediocre thing after that if there weren't really any better alternatives. Then they would go on doing this again and again and again this way. If you allowed some independent developer or some smaller company to put together something that was just as affordable or even cheaper and better, it was poison. So not only did they lower the bar tremendously for how good games should be or how good they should look or whatever, 
they also did everything they could to lock everyone but themselves out of the market so that nobody could get in here and mess up the, yeah, it's not great, but it's all you've got mechanic of maximizing their profit while minimizing their investment. That is what happened to the industry. And the reason that I have not been involved as a digital artist in gaming for a long time has everything to do with that. I didn't mind doing licensed properties. If I could have done a kick-ass job at them, I would have. But every time I did a kick-ass job at that subcontractor, I was punished for it. Later on, quite severely. I won't tell that story. That story could get me in trouble. But... Um, by the time I, 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 I left that subcontractor, as it turns out, about six months before it ceased to exist, um, I left for my own reasons to do something else entirely. And I, I have developed a real deep interest in pixel artists who are doing art with pixels, but I have no particular desire to look back at the gaming industry, although I am aware that that independent developers have finally, you know, reached their moment of triumph. And I am aware that there are some beautiful and really fascinating games out there, but I've moved too far on to go back. So every now and then I buy an, ind an indie game just because it's gorgeous and I play it, but I play it as much to see the art and to hear the music as anything else. So. That, that's so depressing to hear that that's the state of the games industry. Well, I don't even know that it is the state of the games industry right now, but it was the state of the games industry uh, through the through the uh, early the 2000s and the 2000 teens. That was the state of the gaming industry. And I don't I don't I mean, I'm sure to some extent that still is. The world is never going to get tired of people who are finding ways to make billions for nothing. Um, there's, there's, you know, the world is run by people who pretty much are interested in giving nothing and getting everything. But it reminds uh, me of the story of, of Loom, given that it was an innovative game, but it was less successful for mm -hmm. being uh, innovative because people mm -hmm. didn't like the fact that it was short, didn't like the fact that it was easy, didn't like the fact that unlike previous games, it didn't have verbs, it had this staff. Mm -hmm. And you had to play melodies in, instead of um, instead of using the inventory. So people don't always appreciate innovation, and sometimes no. you actually get punished for it by lower sales. And then you need to choose mm -hmm. if you want to innovate in the future while risking the fact that the game will fail, not for being a bad game, but for being innovative. All right, and innovation and takes time. In innovation takes time and it takes resources, which means it takes money. But honestly, it wasn't just it wasn't just a suppression of innovation. It was a suppression of quality. Quality takes time and people and money. And I I attended a big company meeting at that big subcontractor in Seattle shortly before its demise, where the head of the company stood up in front of all of us and told us that he was convinced that we were headed towards being the world's foremost subcontracting, you know, the industry's foremost subcontracting producer of excellent games. And somebody brought up quality issues and he said, excellence will always be our first priority here whenever it is cost effective. That was his statement. Excellence will always be our top priority whenever it is cost effective. And I thought, well, he just announced that we that that excellence will never be a priority here. That's what he just said, because excellence is never cost effective, and that's what people were being punished for, fired for, and shamed for at Lucasfilm when I left, was being excellent instead of cost effective. So it's not just innovation; it was quality too. I mean. Yeah. Anyhow, I, we don't have to go on about this. The, the, the point the point is, and, and again, I I left I, I lost interest in the industry um, around 2008, 2009, around the time I, I left shortly before I left that subcontractor. I have really not paid attention. I have, however, seen a number of really beautiful indie games out there. 
And my impression is that we are entering an era because of the internet, because of the increasing um, infrastructure and viability of self-publishing and of, you know, direct from creator to audience options that are growing up in the world now, I get the impression that the big industries have pretty much failed to prevent better things from ever reaching the attention of their intended audience and that therefore they are being compelled to up some of their own quality. Uh, I get the impression that there is a richer and richer field of indie products out there that are creative and gorgeous. So I am not suggesting for a minute that that's necessarily the condition of the gaming industry right now, but it was when I left. And I'm 66 and I am headed towards retiring every year. Again, I intend to retire this year in general. So, you know, the, the fact that I'm not going back to check it out now isn't because I don't think I'll like what I find. It's just because, it, you know, this I had my time and it's somebody else's time now which is just fine with me. I enjoy looking at what other people do. I am inspired by looking at what other people do. I, I spent my time being a producer and we have already established how much attention I did or didn't pay to a lot of aspects of that. Now I am really enjoying being the audience who's the one being inspired by other people's work. I am enjoying that very much when it happens. Now you and feel like we felt back in the 90s. Yes, now I am beginning to understand what that part was like, and that part is lovely. But let's fast forward to the late 2010s and talk about Thimbleweed Park. Yes. When did you first hear about the project? Well, you know, I have I made a lot of really good lifelong friendships in the tech industry when I was part of it. And a lot of those people remain friends to this day. And uh, my, I guess I was not yet married, but my wife-to-be and I were living in Portland, Oregon at that time uh, on the West Coast of the United States. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was deeply uh, invested in the tech industry at the time. And he mentioned, he asked me if I'd heard about Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick's Kickstarter. And I said, no. Not a thing. So he's the one who told me that there was a Kickstarter project that they were doing to produce a new point and click adventure game like the ones we made back in the 1980s. Um, and I was delighted to hear this. Um, for a variety of reasons, I was really interested Another thing that caused me to lose interest in gaming art and the gaming industry was the, the, the first brick in the wall was the advent of 3D CAD rendered art, like I said. The second mm -hmm. big death knoll for me was the sudden dominance of first person shooter games. Um, I just hated them because the things that I enjoyed about the games that we made and about making those games at Lucasfilm all had to do with the tremendous creativity, um, the tremendous spectrum of creative exercise that was involved in the way those games were made. They were games about storytelling and about puzzle solving and about exploration. They were games about narrative encounters with interesting people in interesting places and, and sense of humor. Humor was a huge part of those games. There, were, there was such a rich blend of ways to exercise your mind and creativity by making those games and by playing those games. It was, it was an event to play one, as obviously you know, because um, here we are all these years mm -hmm. later. But the point about the uh, first person shooter game was pretty much about running down an endless hallway covered in interesting wallpaper and the novelty of 3D space shooting, punching, kicking, stabbing, and blowing up everything you meet until you get to the end of the hall and find a way to shoot, punch, kick, stab, and blow up a big monster, the boss, the level boss, and then go do it again in a new hallway with new wallpaper. There was mm -hmm. no 
there was virtually no storytelling of it. I mean, you know, there were there were tangential, shallow little stories attached to these things, but there was no storytelling along the way. There was no no exploration or discovery. There was no um, interesting encounters or narrative dialogue. There was no puzzle solving except for which combination of thumb twitches was going to get you past this little maneuver. And the dopamine rush that your brain gave you every time you figured one out or made it past a tense exchange of thumb twitching, it was practically an autonomic tick game playing. And I just lost interest. Nothing I was interested in doing as a creative person was happening in these games. Well, then came along the Kickstarter with Ron and Gary that was all about making a game that was all about storytelling and puzzle solving and exploration and interesting dialogue and sense of humor. And I just thought, thank God somebody's making one of these games. So first thing that we did, Shannon and I, after my phone conversation with this friend was go to Kickstarter and look for the thing. And when we found it, we just became backers. We pledged, I don't know, $50 or something to be backers of the Thimbleweed Park project. That was it. I think I probably put a note saying, hi, Ron. Hi, Gary. So glad you're doing this. And clicked whatever you click to become a backer and went back to what we were doing and figured that would be the end of it. I hadn't seen or talked to Gary or Ron in years at that point. You know, my life had moved on in so many ways on multiple occasions since then. So I went back to what we were doing and about a week later, I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. Unfortunately, this was back when I still answered unrecognized phone numbers. Uh, I don't anymore, but uh, because they're almost never from anyone I want to talk to. But um, I did then. So I answered the phone. I said, hello. And Gary Winnick said, Mark, it's Gary. Is this Mark Ferrari? I said, yes, it is. He said, are you still alive? I said, well, obviously I am. Hello, <laughs> Gary. <laughs> How are you? And he said, I'm great. He said, where are you? So I told him where I was living and I told him about Shannon and I told him all of that. And he said, that's great. He said, so listen, this project we're doing, what do you think? And I said, well, I, I think it's fabulous. I mean, I'm just sorry I'm not involved. And he said, good, that's what I was hoping you would say. So they originally asked me simply to do a sort of cameo appearance. I was supposed to do a background or two for it so that they could tell their, I mean, the campaign was still going then. Mm -hmm. So they could tell their Kickstarter backers and people looking in that, you know, Mark Ferrari was now involved. Um, so they had me do a sample screen. It was a sample version. So they sort of described to me the look they were going for. It was a, it was an 8-bit-ish style that was supposed to look and feel like the Lucasfilm point-and-click adventure games has. But there was parallaxing now. There were a few other things because they were going to, you know, this game was going to have to function and compete in a world of modern console games. So we weren't being strictly faithful to those original games, but it was supposed to feel and look like we were. You know, you were supposed to have that experience again and not really notice that there were things like parallaxing and maybe a little bit of transparency here and there. So we came up with an approach and they asked me to do a sample screen. So what would a scene look like if you did it in this set of parameters? So I did a version of the scene of the entrance to the circus with the, the half broken clown face over the wrought iron gate, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. I did a scene like that. I was uh, traveling in Canada, actually, when I did it at the time. So I was working on some stranger's coffee table and sent it off to Gary and Ron and waited to see what they thought. And they called two days later and said they had shown it to a number of their backers and that everyone had agreed that I, I couldn't possibly do a cameo appearance I needed to do all of the art for the backgrounds in this game, that it simply was going to make too big a difference. And so would I be open to that? And I said, you know what? I think I would. So we agreed to do it. And uh, the first and last computer gaming 
digital art project I've done in the last couple of decades that I really, really enjoyed and feel great about to this day. I think it was very challenging. There were a lot of really stressful moments in that procedure. The whole vision of what we were doing kept shifting in really unexpected ways. I think unexpected for everybody. Um, the biggest one was when Microsoft suddenly got wind of the project and decided they wanted it to be an Xbox game. I mean, from a business standpoint and from an audience visibility standpoint, that was spectacular, jaw-droppingly good news. But from a game development standpoint, that was a whole new level. That was like leveling up three or four levels to a boss you hadn't even imagined. Um, we now had to make a game that was going to compete and succeed and fit on Xbox right beside a whole bunch of fully modern 3D rendered, spectacularly cinemagraphic and gorgeous console games. And yet it still had to look and feel like a 1980s point and click adventure game. And Ron had to walk an unbelievably fine line, had to find and walk an unbelievably fine line about where exactly to straddle those two very divergent visions. And that meant that meant that several times during the course of the game, we had to completely rethink the way we'd approached things, including important graphic and style elements and then go back and change things and change things that we'd already done. It meant that we needed a whole lot more staff than had originally been envisioned when it was just a Kickstarter project for, you know, however, a thousand backers. I mean, it just, it just kept changing and the landscape kept changing and the project ended up being far more challenging and lengthy and, uh, demanding than any of us had imagined back when it was a Kickstarter project. But in the end, I think they succeeded brilliantly. It feels and looks like a game from the old days. Even though you're pointing and clicking and it's slow paced, it still worked. And I couldn't feel better about having been involved in that. Um, it was also exhausting and, uh, it was a great time to move to an island, which I did. <laughs> My wife and I live on an island now uh, off the coast of Washington and uh, and just stop. <laughs> so, Is it Monkey Island? Uh, no, no. It's Orcas Island in the in the San Juan Islands off of the coast of Washington. Uh, no talking monkeys and no 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 pirates that I'm aware of. I mean, there are some businesses in town, a case could be made for calling them pirates, but um, uh, yeah, that's that's a universal condition these days. So yeah, it's a, but it's a lovely place. We absolutely love being here. So yeah, I regard Thimbleweed Park as pretty much my computer gaming swan song, and I couldn't depict a better swan song. Um, well, I really. But if we get to Brian Moriarty to work on the sequel to Loom, Could we get you to work on that as well? Well, Brian certainly has my permission to call and talk about it. I'll say that much. I mean, I am a sucker for something that's too good to pass up. I am also seriously ready to retire. And by retire, I don't mean that I'm going to stop writing and doing art. I mean, I'm going to start writing and doing art for nobody but me. Because these days, even more than ever, I have done really enjoyable work with some really enjoyable and very important and influential people in the last few years. And every one of those projects has been abandoned a few months in for very good reasons, unavoidable reasons. But I am still doing fascinating projects and really enjoyable work for enjoyable, creative, amazing people that simply doesn't go the distance because the world is so volatile these days. It is just really hard to bring anything to completion. And what that means is that I end up doing a lot of work that never sees the light of day. And I, and it never gets finished more importantly. So when I retire, I will be doing lots of art and writing, but I will be, I will be working on my own ideas just to do it. And I will be finishing them just to finish them. And when I've finished them, I will 
share them with people. I started an online fantasy serial called Twice shortly before the pandemic. It was going really well till the pandemic. And then in the pandemic, a whole cascade of things just changed or collapsed. Resources I needed and things I had to deal with that made it impossible to allocate the time and energy I'd needed to do this weekly sequel with the art and the writing. So I stopped and I told them I'd be back in two years and that was three or four years ago. I still intend to resume it someday, but it's just been very hard to get back to a place where I could. When I retire, I should be able to address all that stuff and take it the whole way. So that's what I'm hoping to do. So yes, Brian can call and talk to me about a sequel to Loom if it ever actually happens. That I mean, I'm working lovely. really hard. First of all, I'm trying to get Brian. I, I tried to get an executive producer from Disney to see if we can get the rights. And in his postmortem of Loom, then Brian Moriarty mentioned three companies he's willing to give the rights to Loom to work on the sequel. And, yeah. and so I'm trying to get something working. And so if you're, uh, if you're up for it, then it's just another yes in the list. And maybe, maybe yeah, Brian well, will reply to my emails. <laughs> it would be, I mean, it would be delightful just to talk to Brian again. I haven't talked to him in decades. I'm aware of his postmortem. I watched parts of it on YouTube. Um, Brian seems to me a very private person. And I suspect just between you and me that Brian probably has stories of his own to explain why it's been comfortable for him to recede some from the limelight uh, over the years. I think a lot of us actually have reasons why we are more comfortable elsewhere these days. Um, but if Brian wanted to talk to me about that, I would certainly be happy to talk with him about it. I mean, it's, it's offers like this that keep preventing me from retiring. Somebody comes along with something that's just too attractive and interesting to say no to. And then we spend four to six months working on it. And then we have to stop because things have changed and there's really no alternative. And, and you know, there's no bad blood there. I've enjoyed meeting these people. I've enjoyed working with them. I've enjoyed the work I did for them. It was all good, but it doesn't go anywhere. So, you know, that's where that is. Now, you've mentioned in this conversation that you were not a gamer back then, but you became a gamer in recent years. Not, not a gamer, but you actually play games, whether it's your games that you've worked on or in your games. Still, I am still not a frequent or passionate gamer, but I have certainly played Thimbleweed Park all the way through and enjoyed it very oh. much. Yes, yes, I, I do. Cool. Um, and honestly, had a really hard time finishing it, even though I worked on the whole game. Nobody explained most of those puzzles to me. Well, so, you can uh, use the hint system. Yeah, well, I did. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I'm not actually a great gamer. I, I just don't. There's a, there's a kind of protocol to computer gaming. There are conventions that gamers are really familiar with, and I'm not familiar with them, so... There's ways of thinking and expectations about game mechanics that other people see coming from miles away and I just am oblivious to. Boy, I'm, I'm good at being oblivious in all sorts of ways. It's one of my foremost talents. So, well, uh, we played games since we were kids. You just found yes, out that exactly. there are games out there. Yes, I, <laughs> I just found out that it can actually be fun to play something more sophisticated than Pipe Dream. Um, so did you get to play Return to Monkey Island? No, no, I did not. Uh, that <laughs> my primary involvement in that project was supporting Ron as best I could as people began to write me on Twitter, either complaining about the fact that I hadn't been the artist or expressing their condolences to me as if I must be really sad and pissed that he didn't hire me to do the art. And I just spent all my time correcting that those impressions. Um, I thought that 
Ron made all of the <laughs> First of all, having been intimately involved with the production of Thimbleweed Park, I had a unique understanding, I think, of the reasons why Ron made a lot of the decisions he did about the style of that game and the mechanics of that game. I think he learned a lot of lessons he'd have been an idiot to ignore um, through the whole lovely ordeal, but nonetheless ordeal of Thimbleweed Park. I think he had reasons that most people didn't begin to understand and probably still don't. Um, I also think, I think that when somebody does something that an audience decides is important, that audience just thinks that that thing that they did was the greatest thing ever and can't imagine why they wouldn't just keep doing it over and over. I mean, look at what a great thing Secret of Monkey Island is, how the way it looked, the way the way it was put together, the way it was to play. Surely you'll just spend the rest of your life doing that again. Creative people. Games like that come into existence because creative people were excited about the act of creating them. Creative people tend to be creative, which means that when they've done something a couple of times, they're their very creativity leads them to new things to do, things that are exciting because they're new, things that are exciting and engaging for them because they weren't, they haven't been done before. We move on, creative people. We get interested in new things. We want to try new ways. And when we produce something that is the next thing that interests us instead of the last great thing we did, people get very upset as if we've broken some sort of agreement with them. Um, I think that partly what Ron did with Return to Monkey Island was informed by lessons learned during Thimbleweed Park, but I think partly what Ron did um, with Return to Monkey Island was ask himself, well, what do I want to do next? And then he went out and did what he wanted to try next. I am happy that from all reports and impressions I've gotten that the game's done well in spite of mm -hmm. the initial furor over the fact that it wasn't the same. But I think it's I think it's a real misunderstanding of people to assume that creative people will go on doing the same trick you loved last time over and over again. They can't be creative and do that. They can't do that and be creative. So you have to assume that the thing you just loved they did is not likely to be the thing they do again and again. You have to assume that they'll do something completely different next time because that's what creative people do. Yeah, it's the same with musicians. Whenever they try to experiment with a new style or, or change their style a bit, then people are angry that they didn't do the same thing that worked in the last album. And yet... If they do go on doing the same thing that worked in the last album, what do their fans start to say after a year or two? They say, wow, this has become really plastic and formulaic and uninspired. I'm sorry, you were really hot when you first came on. You were so raw and real, and now you've just become this formulaic tool of commercial... Well, blah, blah, blah. well... <laughs> It's because they're doing the same trick you wanted them to do over and over again. So if you don't like that, stop wanting them to do it. Well, the same thing happened with Curse of Monkey Island, which came out in 1997. And it was cartoonish in style, mm -hmm. as opposed to the first two games. So I remember that back in 1997, there were a lot of articles and people were very critical of the new art style because it was too different. And nowadays... It's everyone's favorite game of yeah. the Monkey Island franchise. So right. maybe you need to wait two decades. Well, you do. And then it's, yes. it's everyone's favorite game. I mean, so here's a thing about artists that I think is related to what we're talking about. A lot of artists, including myself, not all of them, but a lot of artists, including myself, pretty much hate everything we draw or paint when we first finish it. It's just a huge disappointment. Almost every piece. And experiencing that phenomenon earlier in my art career, you know, I just kept finishing pieces where I'd had such a glorious idea and 
I had been so absorbed and so engaged by the production of it and I had felt that it was going so well and then I get it all done and I look at it and it's just nothing like what I imagined, nothing like what I was trying for. It just doesn't succeed and I'm so disappointed. And I and I talked with other artists who, who had the same thing and I just couldn't figure out why that kept happening. And eventually I did. An artist is projecting a mental image onto this two-dimensional piece of paper. He is trying to capture a mental concept in two dimensions out here. And the concept we have in here is six-dimensional. It's constantly rotating. It's constantly changing. We see it from different angles all at once or in rapid succession. I mean, there isn't any way to capture all of that on a two-dimensional piece of paper. There's probably no way to capture all of that in a 3D AI virtual environment because there's just too much happening too continuously all at once in your head to get out there. So when we first look at the piece, we are comparing what we got onto the paper with what we had in our heads and there's never any comparison. Three years later, or two years later, when you have completely forgotten everything that was in your head, where you couldn't access that anymore if you tried to, you walk up and you look at this piece and it's gorgeous. It's because you don't have all that other stuff to compare it to anymore. I think the same thing happens for an, for an audience. When you release a game, they have a head full of expectations based on their last experience. And none of those expectations is met suddenly when you see something new in front of you. It isn't until they've gotten over those expectations a few years later, left them behind and forgotten them, that they can look at the game and see the game without seeing their expectations. And then they can appreciate the beauty of the game. But again, the creative person is going to ask, what new thing can I do? The creative person is almost never going to ask, what old thing can I do over again? So people are always going to have to make this adjustment. And I think they make that adjustment just the way an artist loves a piece a year or two later that he couldn't stand the day he finished it. For the same reasons, more or less. Head full of expectations that don't and can't match what's suddenly in front of you. The problem is always the audience. I don't know. I do it to myself. I'm the artist who can't stand what he just drew. So I guess maybe I'm audience and creator. Well, once you work on a certain piece of art, then you're creating it. You're the creator. But when you look at it afterwards, you're the audience. And as the audience, you can be critical of something. And mm -hmm. sometimes even when I'm working on, on games, I can get bored of my own game by the time I finish it. But while I was working on it, it, seems, it seemed interesting and innovative and fun. But yes. once you work on something long enough, then you're bored and sometimes disappointed and sometimes very critical. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just need to leave things on the shelf for some time, get back to them. And if you still think the same things you did back then, then you can be sure that maybe there's something wrong with that. But otherwise, most of the times you look back at it and think to yourself, hey, this is great. Why didn't I yes. release it? Why didn't I... Um, show it to anyone why was i so disappointed no nope. all right you can't win well you can't win i mean you do win obviously sorry ducking you uh you can't win until you get to the point where you have managed to ditch all of the expectations in contrast to what you're seeing. You can't win until you're actually able to see the thing instead of see the thing compared to all other things you were imagining. So obviously, if the games that were at first disappointments are later popular, it means that the audience, even those audiences are capable of losing whatever they were comparing it to and seeing the thing for itself and discovering that it's actually great. So yes, you definitely need to wait a while Every once in a while, someone on Twitter or, or on some social network posts a, a review of one of the classic games. For example, someone posted a review from an Italian magazine for The Secret of Monkey Island, and it got 75% because uh, it wasn't replayable, and the graphics were so-and-so, and the sound wasn't that great. But nowadays, it's considered a classic, and everyone loves every part of that game. 
So it's mm-hmm. always fun to look back at at reviews from back in the day when it was the game that just came out a week ago to the classic that it's become nowadays. And even right. back then, it was a classic. I mean, this is what determines a classic, whether it's classical music or classical games, classical art or any of that. Some things get better or remain as powerful over time, and some things are of the moment and cease to be relevant or appealing after that moment has passed. You don't know where things are classic when they're made. You can't. If, if, pe- if they still speak to people 30 years or 300 years later, then they're classics, and you won't know. I mean, when, the, when a game first comes out and the reviewer starts reacting to it, the reviewer is comparing the game to what's happening now. But what's happening now will have been forgotten in 30 or 40 years. And at that point, people will be able to look at the game without comparing it to anything. Again, it's the same thing. Even the reviewers are succumbing to the fact that they cannot ditch all the things in their head that they're comparing the game to until all those things in their head have vanished. Then you can see the game. And either the game at that point is relevant and powerful or the game is vacuous and uninspired. But you won't know for years. And it's the same again with music. When you look at the Billboard Top 100 for, I don't know, 1991, you can see a song that's been in the top spot for weeks and you don't even remember it when a song that's that hasn't ranked in the Billboard Top 100 or was it number 10 or so has been a classic since. So mm-hmm. you really can't tell. Van Gogh died a failure, an impoverished failure. And look at what his art goes for today. Mm-hmm. You just never know at the time. Now, before we conclude our conversation, I wanted to show you the only official Loom merchandise that was ever released. <laughs> Good, because I never saw it. <laughs> uh, I'm, gu- I'm guessing that Disney didn't see it either, given that it it's probably unofficial. So this is the Loom screen protector. <laughs> Maybe I did see this. Yeah, I, I shared I... it with you on Twitter. Yes, okay, I was going to say, somebody did share this with me, and I guess that was you. Yeah, so what do you think of the Loom screen protector? So the Loom screen protector, first of all, it was uh, done by Loom Electronics Limited in Hong Kong. And my yes. guess is that they probably Googled the word Loom, and this is uh-huh. the first thing that uh, was yeah. uh, on Google. And so they changed mm-hmm. it. They, they even left the island. You know, mm-hmm. they, they removed the, the strings from the hands, by, but they left the island with a tree. And mm-hmm. so... And the logo. It's always always interesting to see, I mean, whether it's art or writing, anything you create, once you've created it and published it, it has a life of its own. And it's like it's like sending kids off to college and then they move out of the house and you hear that they're in Hong Kong doing this and they're in Paris doing that and they're in Buenos Aires doing that. They have lives of their own that are fascinating to hear about but have nothing to do with you anymore. So your drawing of your mother's hands is now on a screen protector for an my iPhone. mother's my mother's my- hands are on a screen protector from Hong Kong. She'll be thrilled to hear that. She's 90 years old now. Okay, one last question for me. What are your plans for 2023 and how can people stay in touch with you and your work? Wow, okay. Well, (laughs) right now it's not very easy to stay in touch with me and my work. There is a website, markferrari.com. It's that simple. I have not updated that website since early in the pandemic, so nothing they see there is going to be very current. However, I do get email sent to me through that website, and I try to respond to it. I lose about two in every ten messages I get to the shuffle. I just can't get to them until finally a week or two has passed, and I don't remember they're there. So I, I fail to get back to some people, but I try to get back to most of the people who email me. And um, so that's a way to be in touch with me and to see what I was working on three or four years ago. Um, 
it is a hope that sometime this summer or early in the fall, I'm actually going to be able to get back to my website and get back to uh, the Twice Serial online and start doing something with those things again. But again, my hopes keep being surprised by what happens in the world instead. So I can't predict anything. Um, I am currently working on three different books. One is a memoir for a client and the other two are sequels um, that I am writing uh, in a collaborative way with my wife. Uh, there is a book called Our Lady of the Islands um, that she and a now deceased author, a very uh, renowned and talented guy named Jay Lake, uh, wrote sort of together um, about 10 years ago. We're doing the sequel to it, Shannon and I. Uh, and Shannon has a series of cozy mysteries set on Orcas Island, the island where we live, uh, that is fairly new, that she is just self-publishing and that has begun to uh, catch an audience. And so we're doing a sequel series uh, to that sequel. And I will be the co-author with her on that. So we are starting to work on the first book in that sequel series. Um, I certainly have some art and writing, uh, very specific art and writing uh, projects that I want to get to as soon as I retire. But again, still very unclear whether this will be the year I manage to retire. So can't make a lot of promises about exactly when on those either. Um, the, the, the pandemic has been very easy on my wife and I personally, but it has been very problematic for a whole lot of friends and family that we're very close to. We have spent a great deal of time participating and involved with the people around us who have been struggling with a lot of things resulting largely from, not entirely, but largely from that. Uh, so we, we have been in that way as discombobulated as everybody has been for the past few years. But we're all hoping that over the next year or two, if the US Congress decides not to crash the whole country just for the hell of it in the next few weeks, we are uh, hoping to, re to emerge from that kind of bardo uh, that we've all been living in and get our act together again. So, you know, check my website now and then someday you might show up and find new material there with actual information. I wish I could say more now, Hopefully but you can certainly too. communicate me through the, the thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you stay in touch with, uh, you, you keep pursuing that. And if you, uh, if Brian decides to get back to you and that happens, by all means, let him know that I'm still here and, I would certainly be delighted for any excuse to talk to him again. Will do. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time to join me for a conversation today. It's been fun chatting with you. Well, it's been fun chatting with you too, and thank you very much. I, I hope it was adequate. <laughs> it was everything I hoped for and more. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>